in a minute. Everybody can hear me okay? Yes. 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 All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our spring symposium organized by the Department of Finance at Cal State University, Long Beach. This is Dr. Pia Gupta, chair of the department and your host, along with Mr. Frank McAnulty, who is a lecturer in our department. Uh, we have two fantastic panels for you today. One, an expert, um, uh, some expert panelists um, and in venture capital and private equity. And the other panel will talk about careers in finance um, that that would that includes CFO and beyond that. Um, I would like to start by thanking our amazing panelists for their willingness to participate in our symposium and for being with us here spending their precious Friday afternoon with us. I would also like to thank Dean Salt for being with us here today. I know it's a very busy time. Uh, Dean Sol, thank you for being with us. Thank you for your support. And also like to thank my department for their support and encouragement. Um, like to uh, give a special shout out to Dr. Wade Martin, uh, professor of economics and director of the Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Cal State Long Beach uh, for connecting us with our first uh, panelists on venture capital. Um, and I would like to thank Ms. Barbara Barkan, who is a CSULB alumni and finance executive for organizing um, and moderating the second panel. Uh, beyond that, I would there are numerous people to thank, but uh, I would uh, like to acknowledge our very, very recent alumni, George Balderas. Uh, who some of you may have known when you attended, uh, if you attended our fall symposium. He was a student then, but we can't let him go, so he's come back here to help us, along with our uh, student assistant, Sonu Jacob from Computer Science. Uh, I'd also like to thank my uh, our department, um, uh, ASC, Ms. Christine Ju, our uh, incredible IT director, Nupur Shah, uh, our webmaster, Ms. Madeline McJones, uh, and our social media expert, Johnny Asierto. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing other people, but uh, I'm very thankful that uh, for everyone who has supported us in this venture. And with that, uh, Dean Sold, kindly take over and say a few words. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Pia. I appreciate um, all the work that you put in, in addition to all the people that you mentioned and thanked. Um, this is the second annual um, Finance Beach Fin Rising Symposium. So that means that uh, you're doing something good and there's some uh, longevity here. And it's so good that it's gonna be spread over two weeks. So that's pretty impressive there. Um, I think in general, these type of events are um, very good because they're usually based around some topic of current interest and they provide a lot of uh, good uh, practical information that uh, is about something that we all have an interest in. And for finance majors, learning about venture capital and private equity can really expand their knowledge. And of course, all of our students want to know about careers in finance, so that's always a good topic. Um, I think when, when we think of universities, we think of teaching and learning, we think of students and faculty, we think of classrooms, of um, chalkboards. Oh, wait a minute, that's my generation, so it's not so much that anymore. But we really do think of, um, you know, the, the transmission of knowledge from faculty to students and mainly around the principles and concepts of a field such as finance. To me, things like these symposiums are so important because it really expands the classroom. And it's just another way that universities can achieve their mission of imparting knowledge. Um, so I, I really applaud the finance department for putting this on. And uh, I sort of scrolled down a bit. There are a lot of participants today. So I know everyone's eager to hear what the uh, panelists 
um, have to say. So I just am here to say thank you to everyone for coming. Thanks to the organizers uh, for all their work. Thanks to all the panelists for agreeing to be here. And I'll just say, I hope everyone has a wonderful time. I won't be able to stay for the whole symposium, but I'm gonna stay for as much as I can. And uh, that let me just turn it back over to UP and just get out of the way and let you start the symposium. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, we appreciate it. once sure, again. We really that. appreciate your um, your support uh, th throughout this um, throughout the organization process. Uh, with that, I would um, like to um, start off introduce with introducing our first panel of experts, and I will let um, Mr. Frank McNulty here take over. Frank, take it on. Thank you, Pia. It's it's good to be here. We're happy to be doing our our second symposium this semester. And I'd like to introduce our speakers. First is first is Nancy Dandridge, who is currently just started the new Long Beach Accelerator with the city of Long Beach. Uh, Nancy is an alumni of uh, CSULB with her bachelor's degree in, in business and accounting and has been involved in the Pasadena Angels after working for almost a decade with SpaceX. Our second panelist is Santosh Devadi. He is uh, the founder of Anamika Ventures, whose core mission is to invest in female founded early stage companies. And Santosh has mentored over 300 business owners, entrepreneurs, and professionals to succeed in their pursuits. And our third panelist is Andrea White Joss, who is a senior executive and serial entrepreneur, advisor and board member. Andrea is the founding executive director of Long Beach Accelerator and founder and CEO of Extra, ExtraVolus.com. And she also serves as an innovation advisor at UCI's Beale School of applied innovation. So we have three tremendously well-versed and experienced uh, people in the in the startup field here. And I know we're all anxious to hear what they have to say. So thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you. So why don't, why don't we start with each of you uh, telling us a little about yourself and what exactly it is you do on a day-to-day -day basis. I guess we'll, we'll start in the order I, I started in. We'll go with uh, Nancy first. Oh, okay, so uh, it was uh, nice to meet you all, um, albeit via Zoom. Uh, boy, on a daily basis, it's hard to say. Um, I uh, am recently uh, very active with the small manufacturing company. They make uh, carts. That it's, it's actually kind of mobile workstations that support the uh, entertainment industry mostly. So think um, they're editing film on site. You know, they're, they're no longer taking canisters of film into a big office. Now they're editing as they go. So everything is digital, as you can imagine. And there's a huge pent up demand for content. So uh, we've been really busy. Um, and I am helping them, not only am I on their board, helping them, advising them, but I'm also uh, doing a software conversion for them. So my experience really is manufacturing. It's been that way uh, pretty much since the start of my career, um, SpaceX most notably, but I've worked for other manufacturers. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I just kind of um, keep educating uh, them on good processes for manufacturing. And then in my spare time, I also uh, am involved with Pasadena Angels, you know, the angel investment um, group. And that, um, boy, you could spend easily spend 60 hours a week just uh, working with them, but I usually limit mine to just a few hours a week. Sorry. Santosh, you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh -oh. Is me or uh, is it coming from somebody else? No, no it stopped. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, first of all, um, thank you in the spirit of uh, International Women's Day. 
Uh, I'm honored and privileged to be part of the, this team of incredible women here. And um, uh, so the question is about uh, what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? So each day is a fun day for me. <laughs> After I've uh, founded Anamica Ventures, uh, my thesis with Anamica Ventures is to invest in female-founded or female-led companies. Uh, every day um, I dedicate my time and expertise to its uh, helping aspiring entrepreneurs and going from point A to point B uh, in realizing their dreams. So that's my uh, daily workout and it's a fun workout. I, I, it's truly gratifying. <laughs> okay, Thank you very much. And Andrea white Gross, um, you're next. Pia, do we have Andrea? Um, we have we have an Andrea, but it's not the right one. <laughs> um, well, this this happens now and then. No, I think uh, she's probably uh, waiting to come in. Uh, I think the tentative schedule start time was one thirty. Oh. Oh well. Okay. Okay. We will come back. We'll, we'll have her jump in okay. when she gets here. It's, uh, okay. We we expected Dean Salt to talk a little longer, but uh, he wanted to be short because he, <laughs> he wanted to hear from you. So, That's totally understandable. <laughs> yeah, here for you. <laughs> um, so how about? How did you um, come to be interested in private equity and venture capital? Why? Why did? How did you end up in this spot? Uh, Nancy, have, we'll 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 jump back in order. Um, okay, great question. Um, boy, I I think you know having worked at SpaceX for. Uh, nearly nine years. Uh, I worked with obviously a very uh, in a very entrepreneur type environment there. You know, fast moving. Worked with a lot, a lot of bright young people. Um, not too many older people. I was definitely uh, on the older side compared to my peers. But um, through that and through a previous stint uh, coaching a speech and debate team, that's another story. Um, I, I really loved working with uh, bright, energetic, um, uh, imaginative people. And so uh, I left SpaceX uh, mainly just because I wanted to get, you know, some semblance of a life back. Um, and then that is just, it, I just wanted to continue working in that realm. So I found a Pasadena Angels. I had a friend who was a member. She kind of made, uh, I made the, she made, gave me the introduction to that. And um, I love it because it's just so much fun listening to uh, companies pitch their ideas. Uh, there, there's, it's just amazing. Every time I go to a meeting, I come back, like I want to invest in all of them. And, but of course you can't. Uh, so, so that's really kind of how I got involved, mainly just because I wanted to be able to help companies with all the experience that I had, uh, but also to uh, stay current with technology and, and, uh, and trends. So my, uh, you know, talking about my entry into the venture investing, it's, uh, I would uh, characterize it as a very serendipitous. <laughs> being, in, uh, being an entrepreneur for 20 plus years, and been through two decent exits and one uh, fashionable crash. <laughs> uh, so uh, beginning of 2018, um, you know, made the transition being a business operator to uh, angel investor. Uh, so I would draw parallels to the sports <laughs> here, like you know, after you pass your prime as an uh, athlete, Either one of the pathways you have is to continue to impact the game is as a coach. <laughs> so the same thing I consider entrepreneurship, where after going through three rounds, and then I felt it's my time to uh, be part of a larger team and, and support uh, female founders in realizing their entrepreneurial dreams. And that's how I 
um, and be, I have 11 year old and being a girl dad that became even more meaningful to uh, be part of a team in changing the narrative of uh, uh, um, the support that exists out there for women especially. And uh, so that, that became the motivation to enter the venture investing and um, uh, seek for opportunities to partake uh, in the phenomenal journeys of uh, these founders and, and help them whatever they need uh, in order to uh, get to their, um, uh, get to the finish line and in realizing their uh, outcome that they're dreamed of. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Andrea? Uh, we the the, que the questions are please tell you tell us a little bit about yourself. I gave you a fabulous introduction earlier, um, if I say so myself. But uh, I'm sure I left a lot of things out. And so a little bit about yourself, and then how did you come to be in this industry? How did you find yourself with the you know Long Beach Accelerator that you literally just opened a week or two ago? <laughs> yeah. It's fresh. Um, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for your patience. I, I was mistaken. I guess I thought it was a start time of 1.30. So here we are, though. And um, so, uh, yeah, so my background is, um, you know, I, I, I used to kind of say I was really an opportunist, and I, and I kind of am, um, I guess. Um, but my background is, you know, spans... Um, investment and, and corporate finance and you know, just executive roles in that sense. And also entrepreneurship. I've had two, um, two tech startup companies. And, um, and so, you know, as I, as I come to the, the Long Beach Accelerator and we start this incredible project, um, really um, my experience is, um, is kind of eclectic. Um, from both the corporate and, and entrepreneurship roles. Um, my, my first company was VC backed. My second company was about um, uh, global seed stage. It was a, uh, it is, I should say a global seed stage investment platform. And so um, it's only sort of in retrospect that I've been able to draw um, some real through threads here. Um, but I, I, I come to the Long Beach Accelerator from the perspective of um, of really being an operator and um, understanding um, what it means to go raise capital and to um, to work with investors um, from an operator standpoint, and now that I'm at the Long Beach Accelerator, um, we're working every day with companies um, in very exciting um, tech spaces. I heard some of the other speakers mention that sort of, um, uh, that sort of draw of being involved in um, the cutting edge of things, of, of sometimes, the, many times, I guess, the bleeding edge of things. Um, it's a very exciting place to be. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, um, getting to work with the whole ecosystem um, at the accelerator is a really, um, uh, you know, I, I just very much like and appreciate the experience of pulling all of these threads together of the, um, from venture capital to the startups themselves to um, service providers and corporate partners and investors, all of that um, coming together. So that's a little bit of background about me. Well, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I did forget one bit of housekeeping at the beginning of this. If anybody has any questions, please type them into the chat so we, we can get them and pass them along. We, we have the chat somewhat restricted, so it just comes to us rather than trying to find questions amongst a, a lot of people chatting with each other. So next, since this symposium is geared more towards the students and their careers and what they might want to do with their lives. How, what would you recommend a path, a career path for people who want to get into this industry? 
and we'll we'll start with Nancy again, and we'll go with Santosh, and then back to Andrea. Um, well, I guess my first question to someone is: is what industry are you wanting to get into? Because obviously, uh, being an entrepreneur could be any industry. So if if your goal is to be an entrepreneur, um, my suggestion would be get some real life experience, whether through a small startup um, or even a larger company. And, and I would just say this, the problem with working for a larger company is you don't really get a big picture of what an organization is. So personally, I prefer medium sized companies where I can see all the pieces and I, I think it's benefited my career because I could get that view as opposed to working for a very large company. So um, this industry is kind of a very broad term, um, but I, I think as far as becoming an entrepreneur, just get some real world experience. When I look at young companies uh, giving a pitch, uh, we always want to see what type of experience they have. So you know, to graduate from school and then all of a sudden start raising money, um, you're probably going to have a, a tough haul of it. So that, that would be my number one piece of advice. To piggyback on Nancy, uh, yes, identifying the industry that you want to be part of is uh, important. And that would, I would say that's the uh, starting point uh, in your research and um, in defining where do you want to begin your career. I mean, two pathways. One, either you want to pursue entrepreneurship or you want to be part of the venture investing, right? So either of these pathways, you need to, uh, once you identified your industry, then find the companies that connects with you, that excites you, and then see whether you can be part of their journey being an intern or getting a, uh, getting a starter job. So where you get the feel for what it means to be in that space and what does it take to succeed in that space. As you uh, uh, do active research, as you go through this process and due diligence, and it also matters is that to find um, your seniors or who have gone through the journey before and choose one to be your mentor, uh, as well as uh, the faculty, uh, so collaborating with the faculty and with uh, alums that helps you to uncover opportunities uh, in the area of your choice. And Andrea? Yeah, I think. Um... You know, it, the answer depends on whether someone wants to go down the entrepreneurial path or the venture capital path. Um, if you're going down the venture capital private ec equity path, um, a good start um, could be working um, as an intern or just getting your start with um, um, you know, a private equity or venture capital firm, um, right? They tend to focus so that it, the industry focus um, can be important as Santosh and, and Nancy mentioned, um, having a background in an industry um, can be important there, or you can get the background in that industry there if they're sort of willing to train and they have programs for that. Um, or it could be an investment bank. Um, that's, a, I think um, I've seen a number of people um, start their career in venture capital and private equity at investment banks. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I, I think um, just one thing to think about whether you choose the venture or entrepreneurial route, both of those routes are um, a lot of work, a lot of hours. It takes a lot of passion to be involved in this space. And so, um, you know, uh, you know, it, it sort of, if you want a comfortable job, this isn't the place. <laughs> it's, um, uh, it, it's a lot, and it requires a lot of sacrifice. Um, so um, on the entrepreneurial side, um, 
Yeah, I, I think um, I, I'm not sure I have much to add to that, except for the fact that find something that you're passionate about and 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 dig in there and explore that and um, and look at the options. Do do your research. Reach out to um, people in your network and contacts. Um, people are really willing to help. I've found um, enormously willing to help if you make a solid effort at understanding what they can help with and um, maybe getting a warm intro. Thank you. Uh, to add to Andrea, if I may, <laughs> the one other option is the fellowship. The Kaufman Fellowship is, is a great way to start in venture investing. Great. Andrew, you brought up a point that, uh, and I'm, I'm going off script here, but you brought up a point that uh, a lot of people talk to students about, you know, find your passion, find what you really like. And I think a lot of people take that to mean they're going to know what it is when they get out of school. Uh, yeah. And so I'd like, I'd like to hear from the three of you as to how you found because you don't get into the business you're in or do the business you're in without being very passionate about it. How did you find that you were passionate about this? Um, it's, it's, it's a feeling of excitement. You know, that's, that is a good point. A lot of people talk about, you know, find your passion, do what you love, that sort of thing. What if you don't know what you love? But the, an indicator is you're excited about it, right? That's just, you know, listen to that feeling and explore, keep yourself open to the possibility you might have told yourself that or envisioned yourself or you know consider yourself one thing but if it doesn't excite you at least open yourself up part time to what does excite you and see what specific areas of that you can get into that um, seem promising Thank you. Uh, I think to add to that point, I think one other thing also helps is uh, being curious. I think uh, once someone uh, develops the discipline of curiosity, it helps them to seek information. And that's uh, as they go through that process, they will get into the space where by just being there, it excites them and getting involved and doing uh, going through the motion. Uh, I think that's when that realization comes along that, yes, uh, you know, I, I can wake up every single day to, to do this. You know, that's one way to uh, convince yourself that this is your passion. <laughs> Nancy, you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, it's funny. I've always kind of said I think passion is overrated. And, and, and I don't mean that in any <laughs> negative sense. I just think that... Um, I think sometimes we tell our young people, find your passion. And um, I think Andrea said it too, you could be like, okay, now I work for a, a retailer and I'm not all that excited about it. Um, you don't really know when you're young what your passion, I should say the majority of people don't. There are uh, some lucky few that do. I didn't, you know, my passion wasn't accounting, but I enjoyed it and I made a good career out of it and it morphed into something that I am now passionate about. So um, I think absolutely um, having drive, curiosity, so important. And um, also know that in every job there's drudgery, right? We all know that. And, and going to school, there's drudgery. And if you can get past that drudgery, I always say, like, if I have a bad week at work, it's like this one week, if I have 10 bad weeks, then maybe I ought to rethink my job. But but get over that drudgery. And if you're starting up your own company and you have months of pain and tremendous hours, when you get over that hump and it feels awesome, then it was all worth it. So that's why I like eh, wake up every morning feeling like you can do it. Some mornings you're not going to feel like you're going to do it, but you got to do it and it's going to be worth it. Thank you. Um, well, we, we, we touched on this, but you know, what are, because I think everybody touched on curiosity as and people don't think of that as actually a skill you know they don't they don't teach it in, in college you know they don't teach it anywhere curiosity is a skill what what do you feel are people's most important skills 
to bring out into the job market to just be successful. We'll, we'll start with Santos this time. We'll mix it up. I would say, uh, I know nobody teaches about curiosity. That in itself becomes, uh, you know, someone take it as a challenge to learn about it. <laughs> Uh, so I think the, the the most important thing is it's about uh, having an open mind and being a, being an active listener and continue um, continue to seek opportunities to discover who you are, who you want to be, and how you want to position yourself to others that are how they how you want others to perceive you so i mean that would be the uh, i would say the leading questions if one starts seeking answer they will figure out the areas that they are good at that the areas that they are not good at and they can find opportunities in the areas they're good at thank you nancy Uh, I think the primary skills or um, attributes are uh, communication is extremely important. Uh, to be able to convey confidence is critical if you're trying to convince anyone to, to give you money or a job or whatever. Um, but I also, uh, I, I also want to say that it's, it's got to be honest confidence. So don't just say you can do something. Say gosh, I've never done that before, but I want to do it. You know, that type of confidence is key to me. And, um, and, and I think curiosity, you know, we keep coming back to it, but I want someone who, um, who has a passion for, for learning. And that's so important to, um, to indicate whether you're gonna have a successful candidate or not. Thank you, and Andrea. Um, I always, uh, when I ha have um, job postings or job listings, I always include um, resourceful and resilient. Um, resourceful because um, generally speaking, in these environments, um, you're talking about in some way sort of resource strapped environments. Um, you know, until you get to the upper, you know, the bit, the, the bigger companies or you know, it's not the upper echelons, it's the, it's the bigger companies where you start having less resource constraints. But when you're really close to the product and the, and the process, you often have resource constraints and it could be time, it could be money, it could be, you know, expertise. Um, and so resourcefulness is massively important to me. Can you figure it out? Um, and, and, and figure it out in an elegant way um, within the constraints. There's yeah, a, lot, a lot more to that, but the, <laughs> it's, it's top one. Now to add to that, I think uh, someone like probably the takeaway can be um, we can give them an acronym of B A M BAM, be bold, <laughs> Authent be authentic, <laughs> and be, uh, you know showcase your maturity. <laughs> in the subject or in the, just as a person. And that definitely uh, gets you where you want to be. So remember, bam. <laughs> so I, I think Santosh, that kind of answers, there was a question in the chat about who is your ideal candidate? Who would you hire? So w would you say one who qualifies for the BAM? BAM, <laughs> yes, of course. No, that's, I would say that would be the entry um, qualifier. And then as uh, more than that, I always enjoy working with people that are open to hearing other perspectives. Um, the people are open for seeking advice and getting coached. And, um, and at the same time, uh, in a, uh, willing to take on risks. That's an important aspect. If you want to stay comfortable and you know you want always be in the area where 
you don't want to be uh, facing adversity, then um, you won't be able to get a job or do the things that ultimately make you happy. So I always look for people that who have an open mind. Okay. Thank you. You know, it, it, it's dawned on me that, you know, Andrea works, has, runs the accelerator in Long Beach and Nancy works with Pasadena Angels and Toast has his own group that sort of does a combination of the two. I'm not sure most of the students truly understand what Pasadena Angels does, what an accelerator does. It might be worthwhile to take five minutes to uh, talk about exactly what those entities do for with and for people. Uh, Nancy, would you like to start? Sure, I'll be happy to. Uh, so, if, if Pasadena Angels is an angel investment group, we have over a hundred members. Uh, people from all walks of life. Uh, they are almost all accredited investors uh, defined by the IRS. And essentially, I think it means net assets of a million or more uh, in broad terms. But uh, I think the important thing about angel investment is more it's, it's startup and seed money. So after an entrepreneur uh, has gone and gotten money from what we call family and friends or family and friends round, you know, mom and dad have maybe given some money um, or their uncle, um, then they might be ready to come to like an angel group. And there's several in Southern California and we actually are not competitors of each other. We all work together and we share leads and it's kind of a nice thing, but um, it's not millions of dollars. It's, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars if you're successful. So I think our average uh, investment with for a company is somewhere around $250,000. It could be as high as 500,000, it could be low as 100,000. So um, it, it, you're not gonna make it rich off uh, what seed money uh, an angel gives you, but um, it might be a good boost, be able to hire that CFO or that marketing person and maybe uh, spend a little bit more money on technology. Um, and so that's what we do. We, we don't have, we do have a fund, but generally we are all individual investors. So we are responsible for our decision whether we invest or not. We're not dependent on you know, someone sitting next to me to invest or not. So we're all individual investors. We're just a group of them. We all get along great, super nice and bright people. They're fun to work with. So that's what Pasadena Angels is, is about. Oh, thank you. A Andrea, if you'd go next, please. Sure. Um, yeah, let me describe, um, best example is, is our, our first cohort that's been in in the accelerator for the last three weeks. Um, <clears throat> so basically, um, we provide a three and a half month um, program, which is a curriculum of um, two workshops uh, per week. It's a very intensive program that cover all aspects of the uh, of a startup's um, um, topical needs for anywhere from business model canvas to um, to building um, financial projections, to um, branding, to um, uh, investment topics. And um, there are about 18 of those modules. We also have um, a speaker series as part of the curriculum every week um, where we bring in leaders um, from the entrepreneurial and investment community. Um, in addition, we have pitch practices that we do every month and um, that sort of culminates in what's called demo days, which are um, where we bring in a bunch of investors and the companies um, pitch them and, um, and uh, hopefully bring in investment. Um, and the companies we have, we currently have seven companies in the accelerator and they range from, um, we have a fintech company. We have two smart cities um, slash IoT companies. We have clean tech. We have um, media and entertainment. We have HR tech. So um, it covers a range of industries and we're agnostic um, as to the, the sectors and industries that we pick, but um, those happen to be the ones that stood out in this 
in this batch. And um, so, you know, the idea is that over three and a half months, we're providing um, capital. Uh, the companies receive $100,000 upfront for, for six to 7% of equity. Um, we're providing the, the curriculum and those um, business acceleration services. We provide um, networks um, to corporate partners, to the resources of Cal State Long Beach, the resources of the city, um, strategic partnerships. We try to make introductions in, in that way. Um, and uh, there's probably something I'm missing, but uh, it's it's a it's a lot that we try to give these companies for three and a half months in order to take them from sort of beta stage to um, to a, a seed or Series A round of funding. Thank you. So you try to get them ready to take them over to Nancy. That's right. <laughs> yes, Pasadena Angels is in our network. Yeah. <laughs> And then we try and get them ready to turn them over to Santosh. <laughs> <laughs> which, um, which is actually a question in the chat for Nancy. That is, how can you become a part of the angel investing team? And how would somebody approach you to be a part of this team? Okay, so uh, I just want to clarify to uh, make a pitch to Pasadena Angels or to join Pasadena Angels. I guess to join. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll ask, uh, I'll answer both of them real quickly, but to join, um, you know, reach out to me. Uh, I think Pia has my, uh, and Frank have my contact information and um, I'm happy to make introductions. We love to talk to uh, potential new members. Um, and there is a, a membership where uh, you don't have to be an accredited investor, but you have maybe an expertise that you can lend to the group. And so the dues are a little bit cheaper. And again, you don't have to be an accredited investor. Um, but other than that, reach out to me and I'd be happy to make the appropriate introductions. Uh, to make a pitch, uh, we have an application process. Uh, it's a month long process that basically uh, Pre-COVID, we had probably 40 to 50 companies submit a month, and those get filtered down to eight, those get filtered down to four, and then the last two remaining are what get um, presented to the entire uh, organization, and then we decide whether we're going to invest or not invest from there. So that's just kind of a quick snapshot view of how um, the Pasadena Angels will uh, consider in investments. Thank you. And Santo. What, yes. <laughs> what, 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 what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> uh, my superpower is to uh, take an aspiring entrepreneur to becoming a successful entrepreneur. <laughs> I, I, I see you, you know, you, you're specialized in the women entrepreneurs because you, you, like me, live in a house full of women, I take it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm ruled by women. Uh, but I, I think that more than that, I, I think it just, um, you know, for each one of us, we always uh, look for purpose in whatever we do. So when I was making transition from being an op a business operator to an angel investor or getting into the venture investing, then it's not just about figuring out what your thesis is going to be, but how you want to be uh, be making an impact. So that as I did research, I've kind of one thing definitely stood out is that women uh, founders or women entrepreneurs, how much they're underserved and underrepresented. So then that uh, I made that as my mission and that became my purpose in terms of how I can become part of a team uh, that, are, that is focused on changing that narrative. So I've been, uh, you know, so th that what, when I wake up every single day, that what uh, uh, gets me going. <laughs> and uh, when I see the, the uh, women that I'm supporting, women that I'm mentoring, or just, um, you know, whenever somebody um, comes to me and looking for help, I'm always willing to help in, uh, in, in a way that uh, is meaningful and uh, uh, and it helps them to go from A to B. Great, thank you. Well, since, since I've got you here, the question's been asked, describe one of your success stories and we'll 
we'll ask each person each person this question how how they came to you what how they grew you know why were they successful so santos if you'd like to okay <laughs> i don't mind at all <laughs> i'll go at it um are you laughing I, so i would say um there are quite a few, but I'll let me pick this particular one, which probably uh, a good one in a way that it can uh, encourage students to take more risk. <laughs> uh, so, uh, there's a company called Tea Drop. Uh, it's a bagless tea. It's a founded uh, by a female. Um, she uh, Early on, she experienced a lot of challenges, but then she uh, went to um, Tory Birch Foundation, applied to it, she got in, and she won that uh, the grand prize at that foundation, and that got her started. And um, so the, uh, her tenacity, her uh, agility to pivot, um, to overcome challenges that what market conditions may present. For instance, uh, the COVID has been challenged to most of the companies out there for most of us uh, in general. Uh, the business model was such that, that she was leaning heavily on um, uh, brick and mortars. And then when COVID came, that most of the stores were closed. So the sales were dramatically down, but she, pivoted quickly and then shifted the percentage uh, reverse basically. And she started a direct to consumer channel. And um, by doing so, she had one of the best years since her start. <laughs> so now she's on her way to raising a significant series A round. What made her successful is that um, being open, uh, being, um, uh, operating with agility and being relentless in her pursuit. So, uh, and her tenacity got her where she is. And she would definitely one of my uh, favorite entrepreneurs in my portfolio or in general. I always try to look for her characteristics and uh, other entrepreneurs who approach me and try to uh, seek for uh, capital or guidance. And um, she's a good uh, model in a way that um, what uh, startuppreneurs um, need to do, uh, how they can develop a mindset that helps them to succeed. Well, I, what, what I've seen with entrepreneurship is flexibility is a key. If you're just determined to do it one way and your way, and that's the only way, no, it's never going to work. And uh, most of the time, the ones that have become successful, and it's not the same what they conceived on day one. I saw right. the same uh, what they came together on day one. It's about being able to adapt along the way and um, building an infrastructure where it is, uh, uh, it's an open environment in all aspects. <laughs> and that helps them to get to the place where they want to be. Thank it's you. a grind. At the end of the day, it's a grind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nancy, would you like to go next? Sure, I'll tell you a, a failure and a success story. I invested in, in both a failure, as most of us have, and a, a success story. So the, uh, I'd say the key difference in these two companies is the first one, the failure, who I will not name, of course. Um, he had a successful uh, tech company. Uh, I think he sold it. He had an exit on it and so decided to start up a new one. And I think where he failed is he had his way of doing it and he didn't take input from anyone else. So uh, we, the board, we all wanted to help him. We all offered our, our expertise and he just wasn't open to listening, even listening to it. Um, and he's now trying to sell the company at a loss. So the second one, of course, innovative, the one that I am I'm very involved in, um, the key difference with their, this founder is uh, he is so open to advice. It doesn't mean he takes all advice, but he listens to it and he asks. He's always asking us, you know, what we think about this or that. And then he'll take that information and then he'll make his own decision. 
And um, not only is he getting extremely educated by doing that, um, he's also coming up with really sound decisions. And he's a bright guy, of course, anyway, so he's learning quickly. Um, and so I think, um, I, I think that's key to success is that, that pursuit of excellence and to know that you don't know it all and to be willing to listen to other people. Thank you. And, and Andrea? Well, since technically we're only about three weeks in, I'm not going to be able to give a success story, although I have to say some of the traction these companies are showing already is is inspiring. But um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know that I have much to add to this one from a no, but, uh, experience. No, Frank, if I may, Andrea being very humble and uh, her first code is already uh, uh, a winning portfolio. <laughs> well, Andrew, I have a, I have a uh, separate question specifically. Uh, somebody asked of you, are technology-based companies the only types of companies that Accelerator accepts? Yes. So, um, but there's a, you know, there's a continuum there, um, right? There's tech and tech enabled. Um, and so, and then, and then at the, far end of the tech continuum is, is deep tech, right? So, um, and different accelerators take, um, you know, specialize in, in, in different areas. So, um, so yes, it is tech, but there's, a, um, there's, there's definitely a continuum there. If, if, if a company is demonstrably tech enabled in a way that enables them to scale, um, then, then, then we'll have a look at it. But, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, because a friend of mine who's actually going to be talking next Friday runs a, a uh, private equity company that invests only in energy related companies. But they bought a tree, tr a nationwide tree trimming company because the biggest customer of tree trimming is utilities. So it's, you may not go that far afield, but I, I think that's a little so I've got I've got some questions from the crowd that I'll just sort of throw out there. Um, what what are each and I, I know we've sort of hit on this, but what is each group's vetting process for people that come to you? I know, um, well, just whoever whoever wants to add more. I know, you know, we've talked about it up to a certain extent, but it's up to you. Um, I can start. I um, the, the I think I said our cycle is about a month long. We meet uh, in about ten months a year. Take a couple months off during the summer, uh, but basically uh, you apply online through Castany Angels. Uh, that initial application gets screened for from our administrator um, Mimi, and um, from there it goes down to eight. And then it's kind of a speed drill. We, go, we you know, the, they make their pitch. So, of course, you have to be super succinct. That's where I think Andrea's group helps a great deal in training these uh, entrepreneurs to be very succinct in their pitches. But um, that's kind of a week-long process. And so then uh, by the second week, you're down to four companies, and you have a little bit more time to make your pitch. You get, you know, 15, 20 minutes Q&A session. Um, and then uh, the two that get voted on from there then make their longer pitch um, to the bigger group at large. So that's kind of the vetting process. It's pretty competitive. And I just want to point out that, uh, you know, with 100 members, you have expertise from all areas. And it's not just tech companies that we hear. We hear manufacturing and entertainment related um, companies and, uh, you know, all walks just about uh, there's just a lot of bright people from a lot of different industries, so there's always someone that's going to be smarter than 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 you in the room, um, which makes it super challenging. But that that's pretty much our process. This is a month long process, and the due diligence could stretch out stretch out uh, a month or two. Hopefully, not that long, but sometimes it will after the after you make that final pitch to the group. And and you want them to come to you after they've already done their beta testing of their product and company that's usually who's most successful or? Yeah, you know, great question. And it's one I struggle with. Um, generally, what I've, what I've observed, if most companies um, either have some revenue or at least they have a very good uh, 
proof of concept. Um, and they maybe they have some interested companies or uh, they have their first purchase order or, or something like that. Or maybe they just have some really important IP. So that's usually the ones that are successful with Pasadena Angels. Very rarely is it, hey, I've got a great idea. They've got to, they've got to do a lot more than that. Right. And uh, Santosh? I, I can oh, go ahead. Right. Go ahead, Andrea. You go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, so our process is um, um, probably you know somewhat similar to um, Pasadena Angels, <clears throat> which is you know an on online application process, and um, we go through three rounds of judging in our admissions committee. The first one is just a, a very high level kind of thumbs up or thumbs down. Do they meet you know, our basic requirements? Do we generally think that we can add value? Yes or no. And then the second one is really um, a deeper dive with a lead um, uh, admissions committee member and, and, a, and a second, and sometimes a subject matter expertise, uh, expert. <clears throat> um, and really digging into the materials that have been provided and um, and going through a set of criteria that we have, a thesis and a set of criteria that we have um, for what we're looking for. And um, some of it is, is maybe a little bit unique to the accelerator. Um, again, mostly based on where we think we can add value. Um, <clears throat> But um, you know, a, a lot of it is similar to, to what you would see in um, you know any typical um, venture capital application or um, uh, you know an angel group application um, or in any pitch deck for that matter. What you know, what does the team look like? What is the product? What's the solution uh, problem? What's the solution? <clears throat> How well do um, do the companies address all of those um, questions? And then, um, and then the third round is an interview round and, um, and then uh, entering negotiations and that sort of thing. The whole process um, takes about, um, well, it depends when you submit the application, but we started, we opened our applications for our second cohort last week and we will complete that process by the end of May for a June start date. So it's a sev several months, depending when you submit your application. Thank you. Santosh? Mine is a bit different compared to Pasadena Angels or the Long Beach Accelerator since I'm, a, I'm an independent authority. <laughs> so generally, um, let, let, uh, let me make it simpler. I think, um, best way that I go about uh, wedding is uh, I look for five P's. <laughs> the first P is um, person or people. And that's most important thing for me personally, because you don't want to be in a bad marriage. <laughs> it's not going to end well. <laughs> so if you can enjoy, like if you know that person well, you understand that person's aspirations. And uh, if you enjoy working with that person, and that's the first uh, check for me. And the second is um, pitch. Uh, that covers the basic, um, are the essentials of the business model or the business in itself. So that gives me an idea that uh, how well um, the team has uh, founder or the team has done their research, how, how deep their understanding is and how, how well they understand the marketplace and other business model or uh, customer acquisition strategy or different things that all that come into the play as part of the pitch. And then third thing is uh, product itself. Well, it could be a service product or um, uh, or a device or a combination of both. So the just in terms of um, looking at the product and uh, the impact the product can have uh, in the target audience, that's the third uh, piece. And then fourth piece is the proof. Uh, have they gathered any proof um, uh, from the customer perspective or the market perspective in general? So uh, where uh, they can establish the viability of the 
idea or the business itself. And then finally, which is the most important thing, as much as the first phase is important, the last phase is also important to me is the profitability. <laughs> What's the probability of this venture getting to profitability? If they can get there, and definitely we know that every single venture is not going to get to the profitability or succeed. Uh, so at least the concept and the team and the strategy should be such that it needs to have a decent odds of getting to profitability. So those are my five P's. Great, thank you. I have a, I have a somewhat long question from actually one of my students. Um, I'll, I'll just read it to you, to the three of you. My name is Rod and I'm currently a member, a senior at CSULB studying finance. I'm currently in active pursuit of creating a framework for a startup pitch I may have soon. I have a white page and a website currently in the process of being made. My question is, where does someone like me at this early stage find the resources like software engineers, funding, and establishment as a student? I'm throwing it out there. And I, my, my idea Talk to Andrea after you're talking to me. It's a <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, I mean, right off the bat, are you accessing the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship there at Cal State Long Beach? Um, I don't know if we can answer live, but it's uh, that would be a natural. Rod, Rod can you uh, type in a response? So that's yeah. sort of, I mean, we, um, we are really looking forward to, I mean, it's our accelerator is a collaboration with the Institute. And so we are really looking forward to um, the Institute's um, comp companies coming through and, and getting prepared um, for the accelerator. So um, I would imagine you would benefit from them if you haven't already. Well, Andrea, the, the answer to that is that we have really bad marketing sometimes at the College of Business. And he says he didn't know about the innovation uh, challenge in that until today, uh, and the Institute until today. Um, it's, it's called the, by the way, it's another question, the, the Cal State Long Beach Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Yes. And it's, I'm it's an incubator program. I'm usually very involved, except uh, somebody else here today keeps making me teach on Tuesday nights. So I, so I, can't, go those, I can't go to those meetings. Um, but uh, now I'm fired. Um, but Rod, let's talk. Come to my office hours Monday. I will get you all set up and pointed in the right direction. Yeah, and just FYI, I'm there every Tuesday night, and yeah. I'm very involved with the institute too. So you can reach out to me as well. And the other, the other thing that I would say is um, there are resources. Um, so the um, the SBDC um, at that's that's attached to and located at UCI. Um, uh, the Small Business Development Council is a tech focused um, SBDC. And so you might um, think about reaching out to them and seeing what sort of resources they have. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I know they have a, a ton of sort of informational se sessions and, and, and speakers and, and things like that. Um, they might have some resources for actually helping work on the business. Um, the, the SBDC located in Long Beach is a little, it, it's more of a traditional um, small business SBDC, but Long Beach also has one, um, not tech focused specifically. Yeah, in the same vein as SBDC, there's other one is also called SCORE. <laughs> you can get access to the active guidance from SCORE, and it is part of the small business administration as well. Right. Thank you. Here, here's, here's a question that actually interests me too. How, how do you, do you ever work with, compete with, cooperate with um, crowdfunding? People that want to do crowdfunding, does that fit into your models at all? Any, anybody? Yeah, I've really 
only seen it in action once. It's not something I've ever, well, I can't say I've never participated in it. I have a little bit. Uh, but my uh, innovator, the company I'm currently uh, working with, they uh, were trying to launch um, a kind of a, a small product that they wanted to see how successful it was and they needed some funding um, uh, to get the tooling done and so forth. And, and they have a big fan base. So they did some crowdfunding for that little project. It wasn't really for equity. It was for to, to, to fund a specific product. But it was pretty successful. They far exceeded their goal. And that's the extent of my knowledge. Thank you. A Andrea Santosh, either of you work with <laughs> No, we don't use uh, view them as a competitor. Uh, it's just another way for entrepreneurs to raise money. And it, the SEC also, in, a re in the recent months, they have relaxed. Uh, earlier, if you have to invest in a private company, you need to be an accredited investor. So SEC has relaxed and they created this new category where, let's say, if you don't qualify as an accredited investor, you can get the certification uh, it's um, going blank on the name of the certification, but it's something ends with 65. <laughs> and if you get that certification, you can um, uh, you get the eligibility to invest in uh, any startups through uh, the crowdfunding platforms like Stat, uh, Start Engine. So it's a great way for people to raise money early on. Um, the, ultimately, you have to go to the consumers if you want to serve them. And this will be a good way to get validation on your story from the consumers. Uh, if they believe in you, if they contribute uh, small checks towards your cost, and you got your already the first set of uh, consumers that you can provide services to. It's a great platform and it has come a long way. Um, at, uh, it's going to be a significant force here on. The two, three years ago, it wasn't that uh, prominent, but it's becoming prominent. Uh, uh, like this, uh, the 2020, late 2020, it became very prominent and will continue to be one. Yeah, I, I would add to that, that um, <clears throat> it's, it's evolving <clears throat> continually. And so um, early on when it was more restrictive, um, there was this um, sense that um, serious investors might not like to see equity crowdfunding on your cap table because that's a lot of individual investors to have on a cap table and, and serious investors, quote unquote, like a clean cap table. And so, um, I mean, that just means for those of you who don't have um, that background, it just means the, the structure of ownership of your company. And so, but with, with the increasing evolution of, the, of crowdfunding, there's, there's equity and non-equity crowdfunding. Um, there are, there are um, ways to package um, a crowdfunding um, equity crowdfunding that is, you essentially have one investor instead of many. Um, and also sort of the nuances of crowdfunding are becoming clearer to people. Um, for those of you with a, a consumer product, it is a very interesting way to get some proof of concept, even aside from any cash that you might, um, might get. Um, for those in sort of B2B and, and other sectors, it's, um, it's a different set of questions, but it's gotten um, pretty nuanced and it's, it's interesting to at least know your options there. Thank you. Well, we're getting close to the end of our time, so I have one more question. And that's since, since you're all out there on the cutting edge of what people are coming up with, what's the next big thing you see coming down the pike? Santos? My favorite uh, subject, next big thing, is the quantum, quantum space, quantum tech, the quantum <clears throat> computing, quantum sensing, and quantum communications. These are the three uh, categories are going to be the next big thing. Uh, just to put uh, things in perspective, uh, the, t the traditional, the computing that what we understand, what it can solve in 20 years, 
the quantum computing can do in less than two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so something I'll never understand. Uh, <laughs> Nancy? Uh, um, well, you know, it's so funny. When I first started with uh, Pastor Angels, which was like roughly three years ago, you know, we were just starting to hear a lot about AI, AI. Well, now AI is everywhere, right? We all know what AI is. Um, and if you don't know what it is, you better go look it up. But um, I still think there's a lot of promise with blockchain technology. Um, some of you may disagree with me, and I'm not talking Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. I'm talking about blockchain technology as it relates to um, medical records and um, land title and that type of thing. I think that still has yet to be proven out, and something like that, I think, is going to be coming down the pipeline fairly soon. I think they're going to figure it out, and I think that'll be a big boon to, um, to industry. Thank you. And Andrea? Yeah, I I would I would answer somewhere along those same lines too. We're you know talking about sort of foundational technologies, technologies that run uh, the platform that everything else is run on, um, and space space tech is really interesting in that sense, um, where we're going with satellites and private um, uh, private private space tech, um, and and I would definitely double down on both what Santosh and Nancy said. The other thing I would say is this is in a way that um, a lot of people's, something that affects a lot of people's lives, um, I think that is going to be um, game changing is um, advances in digital health. Well, thank you. Well, we're, it, we're, we've just about reached our, the end of our time here. Do we, do any of you have anything you'd like to add? You, you think we missed something um, this afternoon? I know we missed lots of things, but something. <laughs> well, there are a, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. There are a couple of questions on the same thing that just popped oh, up. So <laughs> I, I don't see the questions going over to the computer. So. so I'm just going to ask them because there are two questions on the same topic. Thoughts on NFT? <laughs> <laughs> NFT, non-fungible tokens. <laughs> so that that's that's connected a bit to uh, yeah. blockchain, I believe. I guess I, thoughts. I have none. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go on no, record. But, Maybe I shouldn't, um, but it, most of that is the world's largest scam, in my uh, opinion. Um, it's 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 the Dutch tulips of our day. Um, yeah. um, somebody's going to get this, like take a meme of that, and I'm going to, you know, be roasted in uh, in a couple of years. But we'll see. In, in Atlas, Jack Doss is happy that his first tweet got sold on NFT for six and a half million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> One of the persons asking that question is my current student. He's just probably asking that for extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there's 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 something to this underlying it. The the, the, the valuations of these things are crazy, but um, as Nancy said, the, the the blockchain underlying it and the contracts that it creates um, is really really important. So I think to in all seriousness, uh, you know, jokes aside, on NFT, NFT does have merit. Does have. Uh, value that it can bring to the table. The, one of the benefits that I see for creatives, especially uh, using NFT, is like say for instance, if the art gets sold, the artist is benefiting only the first time. When it gets resold, the percentage or any part of that resale, the artist doesn't get benefit. With NFT, now there is a, that trail and every time the art exchanges hands, the artist gets continue to get piece of it. So that's, I would say, a true wealth creation for the artist. And that's mm -hmm. where I see NFT making difference for creatives and why the, all these uh, entertainers and the artists and different uh, uh, disciplines are all gravitating towards the NFT because now they truly deserve uh, to realize their creations in a meaningful way. Okay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. 
good. Well, thank you very much. This was very informative. I think very helpful to the students. I, I learned some new things, so hopefully they did too. And uh, we'll take a 15 minute break to get everybody a chance to relax and get back with uh, our second group of speakers here. Thank you very much, Andrea, Santosh, and Nancy. Yep. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, three of you. And if um, uh, if you have the time and or the inclination, we are just doing kind of a social hour at the end at 4:30. So you know, if I know we've already asked a lot of you, but if you know, any one of you can just come and hang out with our students for a bit, they would be very grateful. But only if you have the time. <laughs> well, to your point, we appreciate the invitation. Uh, actually. Uh, coincidentally, both Santosh and I have our cohort's first pitch practice this afternoon during that time. But so, so wish us well. We'll be there in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody. We'll take a quick. We'll take a short break, and we will be back on at two forty-five these all look really familiar to you and I went on indeed and dot com and and saw or this popped up when I was searching and these are just some of the fields not to say that, that you need to go into these but these are some of them that um, that are popular for sure and just I thought you know there's so many different career paths and one of the things when I mentor students they ask me a lot is how do you know where to go in finance how do you know which is the right path um, and I think it is confusing because there's a lot of ways to go. And I think today, this panel, they have some experience, if not a ton of experience and not maybe all of them, um, but most of them, if not all of them. So I think we're really, really fortunate to be able to have that, have them with us today. So with that, I think my hardest part is to introduce my, my panel. If you looked at the website and clicked on the speakers, you will you will have seen their bio. So I'm gonna start with Roxanne, I'm going alphabetically here. I'm gonna start with Roxanne Austin. And this is a great bio, but I just wanna give you a little bit more insight um, about Roxanne and each of the other panelists as well, because I think that will give you a sense of maybe when you get to asking them questions or hearing uh, their answers, you'll have a better perspective of where they've come from. And actually with Roxanne, I'm gonna start kind of backwards because when I met her, she is just coming out of Deloitte and I think she was the youngest partner that they had ever had there, uh, I think in Los, it was at Los Angeles. And she came to Hughes, it was Hughes Electronics back then as the controller quickly became CFO. And that's where I, I uh, worked with her. And um, when I left Hughes at the time, she was president of DirecTV. And at that point I thought, oh my gosh, that's incredible. She's so smart. Um, she was so great to work with, but she has gone on now. And that's why we, one of the reasons for all of these panelists, we called it uh, careers in finance and beyond because she's taken um, that beginning and moved it into helping all these other companies and been on the board of you know, huge companies like Target current and Ericsson, currently Verizon, um, Abbott Labs, and um, she has her own uh, investment company advisors as well. So, she, oh, and another thing that I highlighted here that was amazing is um, in, to, in 2018, she was the board of director of the year. And in 2019, 18 and 19, she was one of the most influential women in the boardroom. So we're so lucky to have Roxanne with us today. Um, our next panelist, oh, I didn't go in alphabetical order here. I don't know how that happened in my chart. Okay, I got to flip over to Connie. You're going in order of the people on the screen, maybe. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's what it is. Um, so I met Connie um, later in my career, and we, were, we, were, we both were um, working in finance. And as soon as we met, we just sort of kind of talked, spoke the same language. And so we've, we've done... Um, Connie's actually helped me do some nonprofits together and she's supported other things at Cal State Long Beach. The, um, the international, she was a judge for the international uh, business strategy competition. So uh, appreciate that. And again, with Connie, she, she started out with the IRS and then built a career in tax and went on to work for Price Waterhouse and um, became one of the 18 member, um, oh my gosh, where did I put that exact title of that? Hold on, Connie, I'm gonna get this right. Um, see, I knew this would be the hardest part I would do. 
um, because I have it in, oh, here it is. The, the 18, help me out here. The 18 member, I know it's an 18 member governance board. <laughs> governance board, yeah. Is that what it is for Pricewaterhouse? And she has over 30 years of experience. She's done compliance, taxation, M&A, um, public registration. She's also currently on the board of um, several public publicly traded companies. She's on audit committees, governance, and compensation committees. Um, she's done a lot of change management and been in charge of those kind of projects as well. And um, let's see, currently with Comfort Systems, uh, Sensata Technologies, again on the New York Stock Exchange as well. And she's also on the board of the V Foundation, which if anyone's heard of, uh, it's a cancer, huge cancer research um, nonprofit and she's been supporting that for many years. But here it is, the 18 member elected board of US Partners and Principals. I knew it was on there somewhere. Um, so thank you, Connie. I always appreciate you helping me out. You guys are amazing. And then finally, but last but not least, um, Dan DeLeon, and let me go to his slide. Here's Dan. Um, Dan also, I met uh, back at, at Hughes uh, when he was, a con was, he was a controller in one of the large business units. He has an accounting background and um, has moved through corporate finance. He's currently with the, he's currently the CFO of the California Endowment, which is the largest uh, health foundation in California. So go going from, oh, with over $3.7 billion in net assets, he oversees everything from all aspects of um, finance, as well as technology operations, accounting, tax, planning and analysis, audit information, technology, and impact investing. And again, students are always saying, you know, not only what do you do in finance, but how do you know what of those things you want to do and where you want to grow? So I know that this will, this will be great. Okay. Um, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time with the, with the bios, but I wanted you to understand who we've got here today and, and how amazing and diverse they are, how accomplished they are. And I hope you'll think of some good questions. So I've prepared a set of questions and then um, at the end we'll we'll go through and um, listen to your questions as well. Okay, so that was my prepared material. So now we're gonna go to um, the questions. Okay, so the first thing I wanna start out with, and I think this is possibly the most important question because I think it will give some insight to people trying to figure out their careers and where they're going. So the first question I wanna ask, and, and we can go in whatever order is, how did you know that finance was the right path for you? And give a little background of what that path was. I know my path was crazy. It was not your typical uh, straight path. Um, so I think that is interesting for students. So um, Roxanne, let's start with you. Can you share a little bit about how you knew finance was right for you and what that path looked like a little bit? Well, the honest answer is I, I didn't know it was the right path at first, if you want to know the truth. Um, I started out pre-med in college and I was doing incredibly well in my classes, but I didn't love them. You know, lots of math, lots of, of science. Um, and I was doing well, but I, I wasn't happy. So I, my mother was a tax professional, um, had had her own tax practice for years. I always, I thought in my own mind as a kid, you know, that this, maybe this is, maybe that's a boring thing to think about, you know, but then when I, you know, I get to college and I'm taking, I'm pre-med, I'm taking these classes and I said, you know, maybe I'll just try a few business classes. Maybe I'll try an accounting course, you know, and I tried them and it was, it was like natural to me. I love them. I enjoyed them. I learned so much. And I thought, then I just slowly started switching my classes over. I didn't tell my parents that I'd made that switch until I was full on, you know, oh, by the way, I'm not going to be pre-med anymore. I'm now I'm going to be an accounting major. So <laughs> they were shocked, but happy because I think it was a natural thing. It, to, for me, it came, it came naturally. And I realized that you should go with your strengths. And I was, you know, I was trying to be a doctor because I thought that was a great thing to be. And it's a great profession, but I didn't, I didn't realize that my true strengths lie in business and that I think that was the right decision for me. So I got an accounting degree. Um, and I went to work for Deloitte and Touche. It was then Deloitte Haskins and Sales. It's been a long time ago. Um, in San Antonio as an intern and then went out to Los Angeles for my first, uh, you know, full-time job out here in LA. Um, it was a great, it was a great move. I left, you know, a small place, uh, you know, small office in San Antonio and moved out to LA with lots and lots of, of people starting. And it was honestly the best thing that I ever did. A, making the move to LA. There's so much more opportunity here. 
and then also having the opportunity to start at Deloitte. Um, I was in aerospace and defense, um, which is, that's where I met Barbara, of course, but I was in aerospace and defense at Deloitte. I had two specialties, mergers and acquisitions and aerospace and defense. Had the opportunity to work on some of the biggest LBOs that the firm worked on. We had Forceman Little and KKR as our clients at the time. So I had the chance to do that. Um, I had specialty, I did consulting and auditing, but I was an audit partner. Uh, also did consulting uh, during the entire time I was at Deloitte in those two primary areas, aerospace and defense and mergers and acquisitions. Um, then I had this oppor opportunity to go to Hughes and Hughes at the time was you know, one of the largest aerospace companies in the country. Um, it was my client for a number of years. I thought it was a terrific company, great people, um, knew it really, really well. But, you know, I was going in as I think at the time, a 32 year old, you know, <laughs> uh, woman, which there weren't a lot of us in as vice president level at that time at Hughes. And so got to go there in that role and got some great advice on my very first day, which is you don't know anything. Um, <laughs> you need to listen a lot more. You, you came out of a, of a, of a, a uh, firm that thought you made you think that you know a lot and you do, but you don't know what you don't know. And there's people here that are 20, 30 years, your your senior that know a hell of a lot more than you'll ever know. So you need to be quiet, listen and learn. And so that was a great set of advice on that very first day there. Um, had a great career at Hughes. As Barbara said, I was, I was vice president controller, my first job member of the policy board, which was, you know, rare. There were no other women members of the policy board at the time. So it was a great opportunity to do that. Um, became the treasurer and controller, and then ultimately, as Barbara said, CFO. Um, I then went out to run DirecTV, which we did a ton of stuff at Hughes. We spun, merged, split, did all kinds of crazy stuff while I was there, but had the opportunity to go out and run DirecTV, which was a great opportunity to take finance into a leadership role and, and running a business. And it was a, a business in crisis um, and had the opportunity to run that. Um, I left we left there after we sold the business and decided to go back into consulting and figure out what I wanted to do next and had tons of opportunity to work with lots of great companies during that time frame. And then I've been on a number of, as Barbara said, of really, really great boards um, and have seen them through different times in their, in their development as companies, you know, crises and been through crises and all types of things, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, but great companies, Target, Ericsson, Abbott, Adby, Verizon, um, CrowdStrike, Teledyne, these are all great businesses and, and I've learned so much from those and also hopefully have been able to contribute to them. So it's been a, it's been a really, it's really a great path for me, but I've been, I've had a lot of careers in my career. So, you know, there's a lot to talk about. So anyway, that's it for me. Yeah, it's, I just have to make one comment that you mentioned about you don't know what you don't know, because I can remember, Roxanne, when I first met you, I was just coming to corporate from being in a business unit and I, I thought being in a business unit was where all the people made made the decisions, made the product, and going to corporate, um, what could those people possibly know? I thought they're just a bunch of you know bookkeeping people. And I remember coming to corporate, going, "Oh my God, I don't know anything. I hadn't done you know." I remember the term EBITDA, and I thought, "What the heck is that?" Because we never dealt with some of that at the business unit level. So that is a really good point. You reminded me of, um, of what that's like when you change in in companies or whatever. Okay, let's um, let's move on to Dan. Dan, why don't you tell us a little bit about your career path and how you knew and um, how you knew it was right and how your sure. career progressed. Thanks, Barbara. And thanks for including and inviting me. I have to say I'm honored to be on this panel with Connie and Roxanne and yourself. Uh, I feel uh, completely unworthy of being in uh, in the same in, in the same four boxes here. But thank you for inviting me. Um, my uh, background to start with, um, I had a father who was the first in his, in our, his family to go to college. He grew up actually as a child working in the fields of Santa Paula and was motivated by a teacher to go to college and, uh, well, went to, the, the, went to World War II, fought in the Army, became a captain, and then ended up on the GI Bill going to USC and graduating and getting his degree, becoming a teacher. And he really is the one who motivated me from an early age to get into college and to get a degree that's going to get you a job, it's going to pay money. He said, don't become a teacher. So <laughs> no offense, uh, Dr. Solt there, um, but um, it, get something with a degree, something with a license, something a professional uh, piece of paper that will you know, carry you through life. And I had a, um, in high school, I had a brother-in-law who was a CPA and successful in living in Portland, Oregon, and I knew nothing about the field, 
but decided to try accounting as a uh, elective in high school. And they had a um, class I did well in, and they had a club at the time, I don't know if it's still around, called the Future Business Leaders of America. And I ended up doing well in accounting and competing in this club and going on to state competition. So I guess it was similar to what Roxanne felt. It was something that clicked with me and I knew I could do at least the books, the debits and credits part of it. And I kind of enjoyed it. So I, I am one of those few people who went into college knowing he was going to be an accounting major. And uh, as, as horrible as that sounds, I was on that path and I think it, it really, um, it, it worked out well for me. I went from college, I graduated and uh, went into public accounting, went to a firm called Coopers and Librand, which is now part of PwC. Uh, was had a ter terrific experience there, seven years there, which included an overseas assignment to Indonesia for two years, uh, really learned a lot and came back from Indonesia and realized I didn't want to stay on to become partner, uh, was ready for private industry. I made the move into private industry, uh, got a job in high tech distribution as a director of financial reporting, doing SEC reporting and that sort of thing. Uh, was promoted to assistant controller, was then hired away by Barbara, uh, who uh, I met through my wife, worked with her at Hughes Aircraft and joined Boeing Satellite Systems as the controller there. Um, and then just learned very quickly to follow Barbara's footsteps. She left Hughes at Boeing, went to a firm called AT&T Broadband, the cable industry, left that job and uh, put my name in as a potential replacement. I interviewed with AT&T Broadband, ended up succeeding Barbara there as the regional CFO. And uh, that began a four-year stint in the cable industry in which I worked for four different companies in Los Angeles, just through mergers and acquisitions. It was a real tumultuous environment, exciting, but uh, a lot of changes and a lot of changing hands uh, and ended up uh, after the fourth change out of a job when uh, the New York office of Time Warner Cable decided to absorb the LA office. And uh, for the first time in my career was out of work and looking for work. And I found the California endowment through a recruiter who approached me and said, look, Dan, I know you're, you aren't specifically looking for a nonprofit gig, but I think you ought to talk to these people. I think you'll, you'll find a cultural fit people that, um, I think you'll like a lot and vice versa. So I needed to work. I'd been three months on the couch, my wife getting a little tired of me being at home and decided I'll take the interview and see how it goes. I interviewed and he was right. I loved the people, the culture, the environment. And I came home that night and told my wife, look, I, I don't know, this, this could be a boring job, but I need to work. If they give me an offer, I think I'll take it. And then three months into it, I'll be bored and look for a, something, a real job. Um, and uh, they gave me the offer, I accepted it. And here I am going on 12 years later and uh, just enjoying every minute of it. It's, a, it's working for a place with a mission and a purpose and something that's you know, meaningful beyond just the numbers and the, and, the, and the financials. And you know, it's nice. I tell people I went from the cable industry, the most hated industry in the world to one of the most beloved industries in the world, in the California endowment. So uh, that makes a difference. I have learned in, in terms of what you do. And uh, I've been there ever since, still working there and still enjoying it. So that's me. That's awesome. Thank you, Dan. Okay, and Connie Skidmore, can you share with us your of journey? Course. Yes. Um, so my path was really kind of unusual. Um, I, I have a psychology degree from Florida State and I was ready to go to grad school. I was gonna go into gifted ed counseling and just before I started, there was a job fair, a kind of a bulletin board um, available where the IRS was looking for liberal arts students with a high GPA because they were gonna immerse you in six months of intensive tax law training. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And I don't know why I gravitated to that, um, but I thought, oh, I'll give it a try. And they sold me. Um, and I always liked math and numbers, but I, I, none of my education was accounting at all or business. Um, so I took the IRS job and was there about a little over two years. I met my husband there, Barbara knows Dan. 
And um, he got transferred to Houston. And so I just went down the list of accounting firms thinking I could get a job in their tax department. And Cooper's and Library hired me, Dan, <laughs> in Houston. Um, so they were, they were terrific. Um, I ended up having to take classes at night so I could sit for the CPA exam while I was working really long hours, um, but I, I got it done. And uh, I was in Houston about four or five years, did a lot of estate planning and uh, trust and estate work. And then I got into real estate development and did a bunch of real estate work. Houston was booming at the time. So we had huge amount of developer clients. So it was fun. Um, and then Dan and I woke up one day and said, what are we doing in Houston? It's really not that great of a place to live. It's really hot. And in the winter, it's cold. Uh, so I talked to one of my uh, former bosses and he transferred us to Silicon Valley, Coopers and Librand. And that was the best thing we'd ever done. Um, I had a huge opportunity. I completely had to retool myself to be a, become a high tech expert. And that was really difficult, but again, it was, it was fun having that kind of a challenge. Um, I ended up making partner in about seven years um, because I had so many clients and so many experiences that happened so quickly, um, but it was terrific. Uh, throughout my career, I ended up staying at uh, Coopers and Library and then PwC for 30 years. And a lot of people ask, how did, how did you possibly stay somewhere that long? And it was because about every couple of years, I had a completely new job, um, either a new industry. Um, I had a lot of leadership positions where I would start up new businesses for the firm. I started our outsourcing practice in India from, from nothing. Um, I ran part of the tax business and I was the first woman to have a regional P&L responsibility, about $300 million. And I basically had to hire my own CFO, legal person, HR leader, I had to create a sales and marketing function. function. So it was, it was fun. I was actually running a business. So um, I retired in 09. I was 58 because I couldn't run for the board of directors again. And I really liked board work. Um, so that's when I embarked on my kind of second chapter of um, being a board member for public and private companies. And I've worked with a lot of private companies. Um, and as Barbara mentioned, a charity as well as uh, four or five public entities. So it's been, it's been great. But it was not, definitely didn't know I was going to be a finance person. That's for I think sure. it's, I think it's so awesome to hear your stories because it, it, they aren't always a straight path. And I, I think that people don't always realize that. Um, and, and also how life happens, right? Sometimes things pop up that you weren't expecting or an opportunity comes up or, or you lose a job. Dan, I've been there, um, <laughs> you could lose a job and then something better comes along. And so I think for people starting out or even already in their career uh, to be open, just to be open and aware of that because you guys took advantage of that as you went along. And I think that there's a theme of that through all of your career paths, which is pretty obvious. Okay, I'm gonna keep going here. So um, one of the other things that that they I hear a lot from students is, you know, what, what, what are your major responsibilities? Because they don't always know when you're in a different part of finance, um, what, what are the things you have to worry about? You have to know, like you have to, like Connie, you said you got immersed in um, like kind of the high tech when you went to Silicon Valley or real estate, you know, how much do you have to know going in and how much do you learn sort of on the job? So what were some of the major responsibilities you have today or that you did have um, as a prof professional? So in other words, what do you do? What do you guys do? So let's start, um, let's go back to Dan. Why don't you go ahead and start? Because you're in the more operational yeah. position right now than, um, than I think Roxanne and, and Connie. Okay, sure, Barbara, yeah. Um, I would say first, learning is the secret to uh, happiness and long life. You always want to be learning and um, challenging yourself. If you're at a point where just everything's running smoothly, then I think that's when just things get boring and tedious. And I never imagined if this nonprofit private foundation, I would be challenged this way that I have, but it, it has been, it has been very challenging and in a good way. Uh, but, you know, uh, typical CFO roles I have, um, you might expect accounting, tax reporting, closing the books, running the payroll, um, you know, running the AP checks every, every week. Um, you know, internal controls, audit, all of that sort of thing. You spend a lot of time in that early, earlier in your career, mostly um, more financial functional areas. 
But beyond that, you have exposure in, in the finance world to uh, other functions. And um, I've had in my past a warehouse uh, responsibilities for all a warehouse operation. Um, a, a lot of times I've had IT responsibilities, information technology, and I, I have that today. Um, impact investing, that's sort of a new field. I've, um, I have that responsibility where I currently work. It's um, MRI and PRI investing below market and market rate investing with social impact. Um, and we just did a bond ish issuance, public bond issuance, $300 million raising funds for um, grant making at, at my uh, foundation. So yeah, no day is the same. Every day is different. Um, you know, I start my day with a list of things to work on. I put them in a priority order and I work from top to bottom. And it, um, I'm happy to say it's never been a dull moment. Um, I spent a lot of time with budgets, I'd say. Probably budgets represent the biggest chunk of my day, just working on uh, budgetary needs of people, explaining things, moving budget dollars around, accommodating things as I can. Uh, that becomes a big part of the job, budgeting and forecasting. But I hope that, that helps. Yeah, okay. Um, Roxanne, how about you? Back when you were running more operational or just thinking about responsibilities that you have had in the various jobs you've held? Well, I mean, it, everything that Dan said, it, you know, is all also true for me um, in all the major functions. But what I would say is that you're not, you know, all, all, all the technical finance things are there that Dan mentioned. Um, but what we also are, are an advisor to the CEO or your, whomever your boss is. If you're, if, you know, if you're a lower level person, you're, you know, it's whomever your boss is, but you know, you're, you're an advisor, you're a coach, you're, you're helping your people, you're mentoring people. So finance is not just about the technical finance skills because I think those are critically important, but just as you saw Connie grow into a different, into a different space with different sets of skills. I think having to the technical finance, you know, experiences, planning, you know, controllership, um, you know, account, you know, the accounting roles, the, you know, all of that, that's, that's all critically important, the ability to do financings. Um, that's all things you do every day, but you also are leading people and you're managing people even at, at relatively lower levels. I mean, people start managing people relatively quickly. Um, I, I think it's important that, you know, people understand that you're also writing and communicating a lot in finance. People say, I'm a finance, I'm dealing with numbers. No, you're not. <laughs> you're, you are writing and communicating and selling every day in some way, whether it's selling a new proposal or whether it's, you know, you know, helping the board understand or the CEO understand or the director understand or whomever you're speaking with. I think that I think sometimes, and, I, and I'm guilty of this, by the way. So I, I say this out of personal experience, you know, when I went to Deloitte, and people said, oh, you, you know, we had to write up our work and work. I had no idea what you did when you went to Deloitte and Touche and I was this first year auditor, right? And they're like, oh, well now you've got to write up your, you know, your work and you do so much writing. And I was like, I'm like, oh my God, I didn't realize I had to write all the time. So I, you know, I, I so great, you know, you're going to be writing and communicating, uh, building, bu you know, obviously building presentations, making presentations. So public speaking is critically important um as a skill um so there's just there's so much to finance it's not just finance and i think that's important for people to know and i try to advise that i have three young women that i'm mentoring now and i have two young men and you know i say to them look at the end of the day you got to understand you know you're going to sell your entire life even if you're in a finance role so start getting comfortable with that skill set start getting comfortable with the ability to communicate in front of groups start getting comfortable uh, advising and coaching people um, because you're going to be leading people. That's what you're going to be doing. And, you know, finance roles lead to leadership roles. Uh, they are leadership roles. And so I think those are all critical things. So just adding on to what Don's, Dan said, I agree with everything he said and then, and then what I added on. Cool. Connie, can you go ahead and add yeah, your... And I'd love to add to that because it made me think about, um, you know, for those of you that are considering going into the larger accounting firms, the one thing that many of us kind of have taken for granted because we all came from that background is all the soft skills that you're taught at those firms. And you don't even realize you're being taught them, but you are. You're being taught to listen. You're being taught to write. You're being taught to how to sell a new client on a, a new audit or new job or new proposal. 
and all these things, there's actually training programs for all of these soft skills that you, you gain. So I think that is one of the advantages of joining a firm, like one of the larger ones, or even, you know, look, certainly uh, in industry, same thing. You know, the larger right. the firm, the more you're going to get that kind of help and support. So I, I yeah. think I wanted to highlight that. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. In fact, um, I was thinking that about myself is looking for those role models, looking uh, about who, who does things well. And I remember someone advised me early on as a finance person, don't be the no person in the room. It's easy, especially I'm sure Dan, you know, when you're doing budgets, right? Or any of us that were doing budgets, we're always like, no, you can't have that. No, you can't spend it. And you start getting uh, a reputation for, oh, don't go to Barbara. She's just going to say no. So you have to learn how to be tactful and, and say things like, Oh, you know, let me think about that. You just don't say no and smack them in the face right away. You may come back and say no, but you don't say no right away. So absolutely in um, public accounting, you can get that really good organized, uh, expected and required training. You can get it with just working with good people. And sometimes you can get it with working with bad people by saying, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to treat people like that. So no matter where you work, um, just being aware of that and, and observing, I think is, is great. But yeah, I didn't realize, I didn't think about it when all of you being on the panel came, because you've gone so much further than public accounting, right? But that was your initial start. So I, didn't, I hadn't even thought about that. Um, okay, great. Um, the next thing is, you know, we talked about some of the things that you do, the things you're responsible for. I guess I, I'm curious about what are the what are the technical skills that you think are the most important today for the responsibilities that finance people face today, and whether it's accounting or you know some other interpersonal skill. Or what are the the technical skills? Um, and let's see, uh, Roxanne, let's start with you this time. Okay. Well, you know. I I think the technical skills are a given in my mind um, in terms of your ability to analyze investments, your ability to determine, you know, re return on investment and net present values and all those kind of, all the kind of basic the stuff you guys are learning right now, that's all important, but those are a given. Okay. So to me, I think that, that the skills to me that are really important to, to financial people going forward is really the ability to evaluate and help the organization pivot. And, and this year is no, there's, this year is the perfect example. I mean, I, I think about every company that I'm involved with and we've turned, we've had to turn the ship on a dime, right? We've, we, whether you're, you're, we are just, I was, I'm, I chair the compensation committee at Abbott Labs, you know, um, it's $50 billion company in Chicago, um, one of the major healthcare companies in, in the country, but they, they had, we had a plan that we set in, in February and guess what? In March, we completely threw that plan completely out and we completely changed the plan on a dime and said, okay, COVID's here. Uh, we've got to make tons of tests where you know, we, make, we make tons, every category of, of uh, tests in the for COVID-19 as well as all kinds of other things. But we have to change, all of our businesses are, are in completely different mode than we were one month ago today. The finance people had to figure out if we pull this lever, what's going to happen? If we pull that lever, so it's that it's that critical thinking, it's that ability to help the organization pivot, to help them think through the metrics and the levers that are going to impact the organization. If I pull this one, that pops up, or I pull that one, this pops up. It's it's the agility, it's the flexibility, it's the um, critical thinking. Those are the skills that are mattering. Your technical finance skills about the ability to evaluate things and to run numbers, that's a given. It's your mindset, I think, around critical thinking and the ability to pivot and the ability to be agile in those environments. Um, to me, I mean, I think there's just there's just so many, that, that, that we're, now we're gonna come back to communication skills, right? Because to, the board has had, I mean, I can tell you, I mean, going through this, this crisis with every single company, I'm just so impressed with how, how agile and how, how important the finance team was to helping the organization make that pivot. And so I've never seen it more than I saw it this year. I've always known it's there. I've been part of it myself, but this was an unprecedented year for finance and the critical nature of what the finance team plays in these types of situations never was more apparent to me than it was this year. You know, it's, it, it reminds me too of just the students. I, I have this one class that I, I teach and just watching them 
convert to Zoom and dealing with team activities on Zoom and right that pivot that you know it's not just do your coursework don't worry just about the grade but that that like you said critical thinking and how how to internalize it and make it better and learn from it and I think that that is what differentiates people in my mind as well. Okay, let's go. Um, let's go to Connie. Um, can you talk a little bit about what technical skills you see? Yeah, um, I think what's important is a lot of what, of course, Roxanne said, but it's also thinking about the business model and how a company makes money. Yeah, and many companies don't have just one business. They have a lot of different businesses. They may have software. They may have, um, you know construction services, engineering, whatever. But every one of those segments, and I would not technically segments, but every type of company um, business is kind of have a different way of making money. So in finance, we really have to understand the levers um, and, and the metrics so that we can help guide the rest of management to make sure we're maximizing profits. I think the other thing, um, none of us could have predicted COVID, but there are some things that we can predict and that we can be alert to. And I think in the role of finance, it's our job to anticipate where the disruptors are coming from. Um, we're all gonna be, need to be worried about cybersecurity for a long time. Uh, that sometimes fits into the finance function. Uh, we also need to think about disruptive technology and how it's gonna impact every one of those businesses within our company. And start to imagine what does it mean for us? Because all of a sudden, if you've got a competitor that's investing a lot more in these disruptive technologies or this disruptive thinking, you're gonna be behind the, the eight ball and you're not gonna end up with your market share. So I think that's part of the role too. So it, mean, it doesn't just mean waking up every day and looking, having your blinders on and looking at your business, but it's reading all the papers, reading articles, talking to people, staying connected, um, so that you can understand how is our business going to change and what is our role to help it function better. Wow, you guys are great. <laughs> this is awesome. Okay, Dan, over to you for this question. Yeah, I agree completely with everything that's been said. I guess I just would add that it really depends. There's, there's a lot of variation there to that question. It depends on the field you're in, depends on the level of, uh, that you're at because um, you know, that answer might be different if you were an entry level investment analyst, as opposed to a more seasoned manager in uh, financial management, it's a senior financial analyst. Um, but I would just say is you know, there's a there's a curve over your career where the early years you're, you're much more involved with a technical, the technical aspects of the job kind of head down into the weeds and then later on in your career, it's much less of that. It's much more about communication uh, and communication is important throughout your career, but just the relative to the amount of time you're spending earlier on in your career, there might be times where your supervisor just wants you to stay in your lane and stay focused on the detail. And, and um, you know, you just gotta be uh, cognizant of that. No matter where you are in your career, I will say that um, the two things that are going to be important is, understand what your boss's priorities are and and then work on those <laughs> okay and that um <laughs> those simple rules will, will carry you a long way right and that's that's always true can i barbara can i add to something to what connie yeah, said yeah yeah I, I agree a lot with with two of her points but i want to add the two of them just a little bit i think connie what connie said about you know really understanding what drives your business model i think the finance team can help make that simple for the whole, whole organization to understand because one of the things I've always tried to do is try to break, break it down in very simple terms. So everybody in the organization, irrespective of their role, understands what, why are we here and what do we do? And how do I make the business model super, super simple? So I'll use a DirecTV example. So at DirecTV, and I had thought about this when I was CFO before I went out to, at Hughes, before I went out to run DirecTV. Um, my, I said to everybody in the organization, this is a very, our model's very simple. How much we pay to get them, how long we keep them and how much we earn on them while they're here. Okay. That's called, you know, uh, SAC, which is subscriber acquisition costs. How long, you know, how much we pay to get them, how long we keep them, which is churn and how much we pay on them while they're here, which is AMPU, average margin per user. Uh, very simple. And every one of you can have some impact on one of those three things. 
So I think finance can help the organization by, by taking Connie's point of really understand your business model and try to make it simple. See, spot, run, okay? Uh, how simple do we make it? And you know, I think that's, that's critically important. And your other point, Connie, I thought was critically important, which is competition and not being myopic and really understanding your competition. There's so many organizations that are big and successful, and I've been involved in, in, in some of them, that lose, they, they are so successful that they lose, they think they're the best and they're not. They've lost the ability to, to go back and really evaluate themselves against the competition. And that is death to an organization. And when you get in that, when you get in that mindset, um, trying to get out of it is incredibly hard. So I think always staying focused on the outside, the external view, not the internal view is critically important. So sorry, I just wanted to add. No, no, no. I, 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 I want to add, ask a question and, and just chime in if you, if you want to respond. Um, a lot of people on, on the call today are often interviewing. Maybe they are going to get their first job. Maybe they want to change jobs or they're maybe interested in changing jobs. Everything's on Zoom right now. I'm curious, how do you interview for those skills? What do you, how do you, is it a resume, something on their resume? Is it questions that you ask them? If, if you were them and trying to prepare to be what you guys are looking for, to be those critical thinkers, to be those, um, you know, people that have the technical skill but can do more. How do you go about trying to find the candidates that are most appealing? So what advice for people re interviewing? What, how would you help them be better? Oh, I, I guess I'd start. I, I would say, you know, one of the things that I tell the people that I mentor is really do your homework on this business. I mean, you don't show up to an interview unless you understand this business inside. I mean, you need to know everything you need to know about this business and, and know why you want to be there. Why do I want to, why did I pick, you know, I'll use an example. I was, I was mentoring a young woman who's actually not in finance. She was in marketing. And she went right, marketing advertising, and she wanted to go for a specific advertising firm here in Los Angeles called Seventy Two and Sunny. And um, and I said, and I said before I introduce you to the guy who runs Seventy Two and Sunny, I want to I want to have you meet someone else who is um, Jeff Jones, who is now CEO at at, um, at uh, H and R Block, but he was then the CMO at Target, Chief Marketing Officer at Target. And I said, I want you to, to meet Jeff because Jeff used to run an advertising agency. I want you to meet him first because I didn't want to introduce her to these people unless I really believe that she really understood why she wanted to move out to LA. Did she just want to move to LA to move to LA? Was it like, oh, everybody goes Hollywood, you know, blah, blah, blah. So she meets with Jeff. And the thing I said to her before is, you know, you, you got to really understand what you want to, you know, why you want to do this. And Jeff's going to really test you. And Jeff came back and said, she was incredible. Why? She knew exactly why she wanted 72 and Sunny. She had researched all of their advertisements, the specific focus of their advertisements, understood their, their messaging, what they were trying to accomplish. She understood why she wanted to be in advertising in the first place. She, I mean, she had a, a clear answer for why am I here? Why do I want to do it? And why is it this specific company? And she had done her homework. And to me, that the best advice I can give people is, you know, I, you know you're not just trying to get a job you're selling yourself and, and you need to really make sure you can understand why, why this company and why do you want this job and why do you want to be in finance? If you can't answer those questions, you know, for me, that's a killer. So I want, I want people that have really thought about themselves and been introspective and why they and really done their homework. So that's my view. But and Barbara, when you think about the participants on today's call, um, you guys are probably a hundred times better than we were in early in our career, <laughs> <True>. searching <laughs> and getting access to information. We weren't that good at it and there wasn't as much information available. But if you're looking at a public company, there's oh tons of material that you can have access to. Just reading the, the annual report, the 10, the 10 K is, you know, going to give you a ton of information and even private companies, there's so much available. So I just, you know, want to support what Roxanne said. Yeah, ditto. I think great advice from Roxanne. I just would add, always have a question in an interview. I'm surprised how many times I interview people and I don't have any questions at the end. And I, I mean, it's just, I don't know, there's uh, something about that. Flat, I guess right? I'm, I'm old school, but yeah, always have a couple of two or three, maybe have more questions than they were time for it would be ideal. But yeah, I think you just always want to have something. 
It's good. I agree with that, Dan. I think in my, in my example of Jeff Jones, the other thing that he said about this young woman that he met with before we introduced her to 72 and Sunny was she has, she had so many questions for me. It was tough. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me. <laughs> that's how, yeah. That's those are the best interviews. But that's just critical thinking too, right? You know, so. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So I'm going to move on to um, a, a role of, of, key, of key financial professionals. And I know we've, We've talked a lot about corporate finance, and I know there's other financial roles as well. I know when when I um, was working at Hughes yeah. with Roxanne at corporate finance, people were they were kind of I don't know mad or jealous of us because we were everywhere. Like nothing gets decided without finance approving it. You have a seat at the table. You have to keep that seat at the table. But I'm just kind of curious. Um, how you see the roles of finance professionals in whatever arena, whether it's corporate finance directly or um, in an operation or uh, you know banking or whatever you come across, what you see as the roles, have they changed? Um, and you think they're heading somewhere else? I mean, has the, has the pandemic changed finance's role or or you know just over time has it changed? Can, and can jump I in if you want. Yeah, let's start that one. Um, I think what's happened for the benefit of professionals is that the technology has become so advanced that uh, so much can be done that doesn't take hours of manual labor by the accountants and finance teams. So much is, you know, if you get the right tools that are out there, um, you know, robotic processing of data, payables, all that stuff, so much better. So I think what's happened then is that the finance leader and his or her direct reports are real partners with the CEO and, and with the analysts and the investors and uh, all the stakeholders. And so that does elevate the role. And what it means too is that finance professionals are gonna advance much more quickly than what we all did in my view, because they don't have to do the routine stuff anymore. Um, so that's just kind of one thought I wanted to pass along. Oh, that's interesting. I agree yeah. with that 100%. I think that, that, that the ability now, that, that's why it makes it even more important to us. To, we use our judgment. We're using our critical thinking. We're not, as Connie said, we're not having to do all the, the manual tasks and things that had to be done the hard way <laughs> for so long. Um, that now you really do get to use your brain uh, a lot more than very early in your career than you ever got to do you know, in the past. And I think that's that's really incredible. But I also think that that makes finance a great place to start because finance is so critical to the entire, you know, engine of the op of, of an organization. That well, and you know, it's interesting too. I don't know if we have any data on it, but you know, 10, 15 years ago, whoever succeeded the CEO a lot of times was in sales and marketing, maybe engineering. It's a lot more CFOs being yeah. elevated to CEO ranks than it's I think ever before. Is that, do you think that's true? Oh, it's absolutely true. And I actually had some data on that, but I don't have it with me. Um, I wish I'd brought it with me, but I actually, it's, it, you're absolutely right, Connie, about that. You know, and I think there's so much more to the role now. I mean, we're driving risk management. I mean, I think the, the, the finance group's been so much more involved in risk management than it ever was before, right? And I think it's much more operational. If you're in a corporation now, the finance role is much more operational than it ever was before, you know, in terms of really- I, I, had, I had kind of, not the opposite, but when I was at Northrop, one of the key executives that went on to be CEO took a stint as being CFO and was never in finance. And so it was so important to the board that he understand what finance did and how it worked that they made him spend a year or more as a CFO. So that just kind of shows you how, how important the role is. Okay, I want to I want to move on to this next topic because I think it's so important and I do I do get a lot of questions on this, especially if you're in finance, um, the whole ethical side of things. Um, ironically, two of you lived through my ethical meltdown with one of my executives um, back when I was at Hughes. And you know, I hear things like, well, did anyone ever try to get you to change the books? Or did anyone ever hide something? Or um, So I'd, I'd love you to talk a little bit about what kind of challenges, if you face any, maybe you've been really lucky uh, and haven't had to face that, although I don't know. I think we we and it's inevitable to some extent. Um, but have you faced it, or how have you not had to face it? How have you diverted it away? Um, and and share a little bit about that because I do get a lot of questions about, you know, I'm kind of nervous going into finance. Do you run into these things? Can you go to jail? Um, all of that. So can you share a little bit about your experience there and your advice on that? 
I can give one, I, mean, I can give an example. When I first went to Hughes as, as controller, as vice president controller at Hughes, um, Mike Armstrong was the, was the chairman and CEO of the company at the time. And it was my very first week. And one of the unenviable jobs at the time that they put in this very senior role that I had to do was approve Mike Armstrong's expense report. Mm -hmm. And so, so I got Mike Armstrong's expense report. And I mean, I'm not talking about this. He would laugh at this story. So I'm okay to sharing this story. So I get Mike Armstrong's expense report and there was, you know, I get this bill for this very significant bill and it said it was for the wild goose. And at the time there was a, there was a, there was a, you know, a strip club in, in the area that was called the wild goose. And I walked into his office and I said, Mike, I can't approve this. I am not going to approve a strip club receipt. And I'm sorry. And this is my very first week at the company. Right. And Mike goes, He's laughing, he's hitting his leg and he's laughing and roaring in his seat. And he goes, Roxanne, it was, a, it was John Wayne's boat. I took a bunch of, you know, of the Hughes people out on this boat to thank them for all that they have done. There's a, and, and John Wayne's boat was called the Wild Goose. Oh, that's so, hysterical. So, you know, I think you always have to do the right thing even when it's hard to do. And, you know, we always, you know, I, I can tell there's so many stories I have about this situation. Our job, is not to be Dr. No, as, as Barbara said, but to walk into the office and say, look, we just can't do this. And, and let me explain to you why. And we always have to have our moral compass because that's who we are. And, and I, I always felt like finance was always a strong moral compass for the organization. And we just got to do the right thing. And sometimes that means saying no and saying tough stuff. To your and, boss. To your boss. <laughs> and I've done it many, many times. <laughs> uh, no, we can't do that accounting. No, we can't do this. You know, but, but here's why. And luckily, all of my bosses always listened, and I didn't have to, you know, have an, uh, uh, the situation where I'd have to leave. But quite frankly, I would have left had I been in an unethical situation, and I wasn't comfortable with it because your integrity and your moral compass is very important, and you've got to always follow your north star, no matter what. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was just going to say that the, we talked about technical skills earlier, but their their values are even more important than and technical skills, your ethics, your integrity. And uh, I, I agree with what Barbara and Roxanne said, you will be challenged with an ethical issue like this. There's no, there's no way around it, but we all are. And you, you, have, you will face these, what I refer to as fall on your sword moments. And when it happens, you, you have to be prepared for it and be prepared to walk if that's what it comes to. Um, there's a lot of pressure on quarterly earnings and pressure to, inflate results or make uh, bad results look less bad or mischaracterize things. Um, and, and ultimately you're the one who may be the one that um, can do the right thing and stop it from happening. And I can tell you, I've had my share of handful, fortunately not too many, but um, even recently, did, and it's not, this one wasn't so much an ethical breach, but just a board who didn't really understand this bond issuance I talked about. The board wanted to move forward with the bond issuance without any rationale or justification for it. And in our world, in private foundation, you can't do um, what's called debt financed investing. And if we didn't have a justification for the bonds, it would have been um, put us at, at risk for um, a tax and a penalty. So it was literally me against the entire board telling them, no, I'm not comfortable doing this and you know, this was recent and, and so it, it happens throughout your career um, but I've been fortunate and I would say it doesn't always work out in your favor but I would say nine times out of ten you come out stronger and people respect you more for standing up and see you as an honest person who's going to do what they think is right and okay. so just be prepared that does happen. I do want to play off of what Dan's talking about in terms of the pressure in the field to make results, whether it's just to make the results for your unit or because your bonus is tied to it, whatever the reason. Um, one of the companies I work with, we're very global and we're in the auto supply business. So we, we work in places that are not desirable. A lot of places in China, a lot of places in Mexico, and we have issues, I might mean a lot of issues. Um, so as an audit committee chair, what I've done is I've really tried to put um, a lot more pressure on the CEO to make sure that we have tone at the top, 
as this is an organization with the right culture and to the point where he's been going around the globe. Um, and when I when I speak to the controllers conference, you know, I'm, I'm talking to people that have just joined the organization in finance saying that, you know, you're the eyes and ears for all of us, you know, to hold all of us accountable to making sure that we're doing the right thing, because it, it's something that you can never let up on. Um, the bigger the organization and the more widespread, um, it's, it's hard to do. And I think that's I think, part of our role. I think there's also, I found sometimes a bit of a dichotomy that leaders in high places, um, and not even that high, but you have to have a certain ego structure in my mind to be a leader, to be confident, to take chances or measured chances. And that, that ego structure sometimes also comes with, um, I can do whatever I want a little bit. And so it's a really hard balance to tell someone with, that needs to be that personality to be successful for the company that sometimes they can't do what they want to do. And um, I've run across a few of those ego structures that <laughs> didn't match mine all the time, but um, you guys know what I mean. Okay, the next question, can I, I think- can I, can I just have one other yes. point, Barbara? It, it, the other thing that I think is important in this question is, is not just you know ethical questions, but emotional questions. So I think an organization sometimes gets emotional about a decision or let's say tied to an acquisition. Let's let's use that as an example. And you know the, the people say keep pushing the finance to say, well, let's can we make can't we make the numbers a little better? I mean, can, aren't the synergies? Couldn't they be better? Couldn't this be? You know, well, okay, you want me to? You know, no. I mean, we've done we've pushed it as far as we can push it. And sometimes I think so. I think our job sometimes. Finance helps us in the sense that we have numbers. Um, there is judgment, but at the end of the day, we can't let emotion drive an organization's decision. It has to be fact-based and it has to be supported. And so, you know, that's another job that sometimes where we have to, you know, use our continue to stay down the path of saying, no, we're going to continue our rationale. If we don't have good rationale, we don't have good numbers, you know, yeah. sorry. And they may try to bully us a little, right? <laughs> Come on, we've already invested all this time and energy. Yeah, I know. Okay, so this next question I think should be kind of fun. Um, it's about what you most enjoy about your career. Your career, and I, I just want to add going into this question my own personal thing because when I was writing these questions, it made me reflect a little bit. And I, I can remember, and I, I do tell people I mentor that this as well that sometimes it's earlier in your journey or somewhere in your journey that you didn't expect to enjoy. I think I was always uh, right or wrong, somewhat ambitious or competitive maybe. And I always thought, okay, I have to get there. I have to get there. I have to get that next level of that next job. And I'd look back and I'd say, you know, some of my happiest times were just working with a really great team doing really great work. And yeah, money's great and position is great. But sometimes the best time I had was just working with people that I enjoyed, who we all were in at 120%, 150%. Um, so to me, you know, a most enjoyable is, is the people that I'm working with a bit. It's something that sticks in my mind. But I'd like you guys to share also, you know, what do you, we're, finance is hard. It's a lot of work. It can be risky. It can be uh, tedious and all that. What, what do you enjoy? What have you enjoyed? Well, I, 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 I got a couple things. Go ahead, Tony. Do you want to go? We can. Um, I, I have. To, I have two. I guess. First of all, you're going to need my head examined after I say this. But um, my most incredible, memorable times have been during times that were really hard. They were. They were. There were times when businesses were at inflection points. Um, it's when a team had to come together to figure a way out of what looked like a dire, dire situation. So, you know, whether that was, you know, DirecTV trying to, to go from not having a business, I mean, we had a great business, you know, we had a great, we had a great brand and a great customer base. We had all that, we didn't have a business. And so we had to completely turn the ship around while it's going 90 miles an hour down the, down the road. It was, it was tr Target going through the data breach and, you know, having the opportunity to go in and lead a team through an incredible crisis and, and figure out where we go from here. It was you know, different companies, I've got so many examples, but it was, it was the hardest times that for me wound up being my most memorable and actually most enjoyable because I think I got the most satisfaction out of seeing organizations through that inflection point. Um, and at the time it was hard and I, and I, you know, I couldn't even admit to myself, you know, I, I, I was scared at times, right? You know, I'm, I'm running this huge organization and 
the, you know, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It looks like a train. Um, and I, I'm afraid, but I could never show fear in any way, shape or form to my team. I had to, you know, we're going to stay focused. We got to go, keep going and I always stay positive through all that. So I think my, that was, that was clearly all of the, and I, those are so memorable to me and they're, and, and so rewarding, um, that those are those, that's one. And I think the two is people. It was the, it was helping people become great whatever they wanted to accomplish, whether they stayed in finance, which I always think is a great place to start and moved on into key roles. I mean, I have so many people around the country that that work for me at different points in time that are CFOs, that are CEOs, that are in, you know, partners in bank consulting or wherever. They're in different roles around the country that I'm so proud of them. And Barbara, you're one of them. Um, you know, because these people were, that were part of, part of that was helping people grow and, and achieve their potential. And I, I love that. So that's mine. Yeah, I mean, that I just have to add on to that with all of you coming back to be on this panel, you know, for all of you listening and earlier in your career, giving back and, and doing it. You know, now I'm teaching a, a course and um, it whether you're on a board and helping a company or you're doing a nonprofit, that that's fun stuff for sure, for sure. Um, Dan or Connie, did you want to add as to what do you enjoy about your finance career? Honey, where you going to go? I don't want to. Oh, sure, I can go. Uh, yeah, there's no doubt for me. The first is the people and watching them develop, and mainly because my career was so long at the firm. Um, I still have, I have people that I worked with 20, 25 years ago that still call me and we talk and we meet. I mean, it's it's to me, it's still my family. It really is a family. Um, so it's been. It's, it's been rewarding. And I have no children, so it's like, oh gosh, I've got lots of kids now. And um, you know, Johnny, that's an interesting point because I, I don't have facts and data, but I do hear a lot that this generation or upcoming generations feel like they need to move around more often to get the best promotion and raises. Yeah. And um, how, how, do you, how do you feel about that? Well, to me, it's about skill building. And if you're still building skills and you have the have the yeah, opportunity, no, to that, school, so you said that. Um, I think that works the best, you know. And it, if you're not getting that, yes, time to move on. Um, so I think that's it. Um, I was going to say uh, I forgot my other one. I'll turn it over to you, Dan. I was just yeah, the people side of it for sure. Then when uh, you, you guys both hit hit on it for me too, with, uh, promoting somebody that you've developed, having somebody step into your role after you leave a job. It's just, that's the greatest feeling. Somebody yeah. that you feel like you helped them get there. Um, and then just the other thing was when you can take something you've learned and uh, apply it and you see an, an impact from a significant impact to the organization from some unique skill or some knowledge that you brought to the table uh, that there's some moments there that stand out as the best of my career as well. I want to go back to that that little bit of you know changing jobs and and Connie, I loved your answer about you know yeah if you're not learning leave but if to leave just to leave especially if you like what you're doing especially if you like who you're doing it with, um, but I'm curious you know I, I made a big broad assumption that I I don't have the data behind it other than kind of uh, anecdotal but you're you're working with different younger people and interviewing different people do you uh, any of you see this current generation, this just recent generation um, with different, do they bring different things to the table? Are there things you don't particularly like that they bring to the table or that you'd recommend they be careful of? I know um, it's hard to fault anyone for wanting work-life balance. I know that's something that is important. I also think a lot of gen this generation is very noble and they wanna work in industries that give back or nonprofits. Um, so I'm just kind of curious if you have any sense of people you've encountered, uh, good, bad advice, um, kind of generationally that you're encountering. Hey, um, may I may I interrupt for a second? Yeah. Uh, I I have a question. So this was a good point to weave in uh, with okay. the discussion. So as you go through this, so the question is, uh, and I know Connie um, talked about it a little bit, is uh, did you ever struggle to find the balance between business and life? And how long did it take you to discover that equilibrium to balance both? Um, I'll take a stab at that. Um, yeah, in public accounting, I was, you know, almost always doing 70 hour weeks. Um, so it was, it was tough, no question. But what, what I learned was, um, a very important skill 
And I, I have to say, having mentored so many women, I think women learn this skill a little too late in their career. And that skill is build a team and rely on your team because you can't do it all. And I remember used to, I made manager. I remember going into the office on Saturdays and I look around and said, why isn't my team here? What am I doing here? So I wrote a big piece of paper that said delegate. And everything I picked up off my desk, I thought somebody else is going to do this, not me. And so, so you've got to develop the team, but you can't do it all. So that's part of work-life balance, right? But the other thing I learned was um, if you really love what you do, there are ways to figure out how you can combine work and your home life. So for example, you know, as you get older in your profession, you're dealing more with customers or clients or stakeholders, shareholders, whatever. And your significant other or your spouse or whomever might be able to be part of those interactions. And before you know it, you know, it kind of starts to work a lot better. Well, I, I learned uh, work-life balance the hard way um, because I didn't have it for a long time. And, I, and I'm, I really like that about this generation, by the way. I mean, this generation has a different perspective on work-life balance and I applaud it because they don't have to learn it the hard way. <laughs> and I learned it the hard way because I didn't have it. And I worked every day. This is, I'm not proud fact. I'm stating this fact for you because this is what not to do. Um, I, I worked, I was in mergers and acquisitions at the time. I was working on a Forsman little client, um, big LBO firm client. And I worked every day for a year. And I came home one night at midnight and my husband had uh, a piece of paper on the, on the refrigerator. And it said, milk, eggs, bread, wipe. Oh. Now, <laughs> it's midnight, I've been working every day, you know, and I just said, and I'm not a crier, I sat down on the floor and I just started bawling, okay? And my husband comes in and he goes, honey, it was a joke, that was a joke, <laughs> it was a big joke. It didn't feel like a joke at the time, but I had an epiphany at that moment, you know, and you should say, well, you're so stupid, How, why, why did it take you that long? And you'd be right. I mean, the good news about, about most of the people watching this is, you're not going to make that mistake because you, you, you are a better professional. You are better for your company. You are better at everything if you have balance in your life. And I was lucky to have an incredibly supportive spouse who basically did what, you know, supported in every single way, shape and form. But it doesn't, even with that, it wasn't fair to him. Right. And it wasn't, I, and I wasn't as good as when I finally woke up and, <laughs> and got a brain and said, you know, you're right. I can't be so driven that I'm losing track of what's important. And I think I, I'm happy that this generation, this is, I think the purpose-driven nature of this generation, I think the balance of this generation are two of the critical, exciting things about it. And they'll be better, you'll be better for it than we were. Yeah, and uh, I'll try to weave the two questions together into one answer also. I think that this generation is working differently. I see my son starting his first job in public accounting, also working for Grant Thornton, in uh, Los Angeles and he's working from home uh, under COVID and he's doing his busy season. He's working his butt off. I'm really proud of him, um, but it's a little different. Um, there, There's a break in the middle of the day occasionally and he'll come back and work, make up for it by working late at night or on the weekend or um, he'll get the hours and he'll get the job done. I feel like the requirements have changed a little bit where employers are, um, giving a little bit more flexibility to employees to work schedules that suit their, their lives a bit. Um, and I think more of that is good. And I think this generation of incoming staff is, is helping along those lines and is great that way. Uh, there's this need for more, more flexibility, but also a need for belonging, mentoring, the things we talked about, cross-functional exposure. I see that new hires that are more comfortable expressing them, themselves in meetings than people in my generation were. Um, those are all things that I think will make, make us stronger in, in our industries and fields. I'd say on the, the things that I don't like, uh, and I'm guilty of this too, um, in this era of instant gratification where information's available instantly, that there's this tendency to just get the answer quickly and move on. And, um, we may have, be losing the art of going deep on a subject, and I would just encourage you to um, not lose that and be okay with learning as an outcome. 
that it's, it's it, yeah, it's efficient and quick to get the answer and move on. But um, I, I worry that we, we do a little bit too much of that, myself included, by the way. Uh, that's all I would say. Yeah, I did, did learn something, more? Barbara. I'm sorry, I learned something um, uh, mentoring a woman at PwC who's a friend of a friend, but um, so she's probably in her third or fourth year. And she and, and many of her associates feel this way. And if they've done a job once, they really don't want to do that same job a second time. And you guys all know that the way public accounting firms make money is you're way better the second time you do that job. So they want the firm wants you to do it at least two or three or four or five times. But so th these younger folks get frustrated because they don't want to do the same job more than once. They want to keep moving up and doing different things. So I think that pressure is on both the firm and the employee to think through that and try to come to something in the middle. Um, but that pressure I think is, is out there. And I think there's also what I, I've seen, Connie, and I mentor, as I said, five young people, but um, there's a need for affirmation. I think the, the reason that people want to change jobs more often, and it, they, there's a need, there's a need to, to have a feeling of affirmation and that they're doing great and that they're achieving. And so what I, my, I've been recommending to the people in leadership positions is that we've got to give this generation more ways to have smaller chunks of accomplishment. Whereas we would say, you wait a year for some recognition of accomplishment. We've got to break it into smaller chunks. That's so, good. right, like every quarter, we're going to have it, you're going to have something we're going to give people feedback and, and positive feedback and some recognition and whatever it is, as opposed to we were used to longer cycles. I don't think this generation is, is patient for this longer cycle. And so my advice to leaders now is to let's break it more down into smaller chunks of, of accomplishment and allow people to achieve things that we can celebrate in shorter periods of time than what perhaps we were used to celebrating. We, you know, we'd wait a year to celebrate something or two years. So this is like every quarter we're gonna, you know, we're gonna set a goal, we're gonna achieve the goal, we're gonna celebrate the goal. So I think that's the way I see it. And I think it's a good thing, but it's just, we have to adapt as, as more senior leaders and how we, how we deal with that. I hadn't even thought of that. That's interesting. Um, so Pia, I, I do have more questions, but I wanna take time. If you have questions, let's make sure we get those addressed as well. Do you have more? Um, yes, there is uh, one more um, question here, if I may. So um, this student wants to know what is the best piece of advice uh, you can give someone who is struggling to figure out what they're interested in and where they want to go with their career. Who wants to answer that one? Ooh, I guess you have to start somewhere, right? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and, I, and, and take a little leap of faith uh, try something. There's not there's not huge downside early in your career if you make a mistake, but you go into it with the attitude that you're going to learn something. You know, give yourself the challenge to learn something out of that experience. Yeah, one of the, I agree with that. I think that um, yeah, yes, jump in, jump in somewhere is right. Um, I, I tell the two young men that I'm mentoring right now. They're just one's just now gotten out of college and the other one's still in college. Um, if you don't know what you want to do and you've got a great finance, you know, got, you're, you're doing well and you're doing well in finance, um, you know, go to an organization where you can see lots of different companies, then go into consulting or go into accounting or go into one of the accounting firms or consulting firms or somewhere where you can see different industries and different businesses. And quite frankly, I had no idea where I wanted. I got to, I got to LA and Deloitte's practice was around aerospace, real estate and government. Well, I said, government's out. And I don't think I want to do real estate, so I'll do aerospace and defense. It was, you know, and I loved it, but I had no idea. I just jumped into one of the three big practices and figured out from there where you go. And it turned out really well for me. But I think you've got to jump in somewhere, as Connie said, but also go somewhere if you can then, if you don't know exactly what you want to do, go somewhere, you know, that has a broader set of experiences available to you if you have that opportunity. I think it's a little bit, I, I wanna say a little bit like picking a college, right? Yeah. What matters to you? Do you care what industry do you're in? Do you care where you live? Uh, even though we're on Zoom a lot right now, but um, <laughs> you care if it's a big company so you can have a lot of opportunities or do you want a little company so you do more concentrated things or broader things? I yeah. mean, you can kind of do 
process of elimination a little bit. Um, I know, Dan, were you going to add to that? Or you were the one that yeah. argued what you wanted to do. I know. So you're, this is the wrong person to answer. I was the <laughs> one. For, but I would just say, give yourself a little bit of a break because it's, it's a long and windy road. And uh, you will change directions so many times and uh, for different reasons. And usually those reasons have to do with people that are mentoring you or people um, that you're learning from. But just um, jump in, you know, even if you're not 100% certain. And, or opportunity. That come. Yeah, opportunities that, that's there. And all, all the better if there are opportunities at that position that expose you to other industries or fields or practices, the wider the, the net, the better. But even if it's not the perfect gig when you first start out, just give yourself a break because there's, there's a lot of uh, learning and a lot of road in front of you. I think I'd also say yes more than I say no. I mean, if I learned one thing in my career, you know, it's, I, I, I was over analytical. I had to analyze every situation and think about every situation and pros and cons and this and that. Say yes more than you say no. Don't be afraid to try something. Just say yes and try it. <laughs> I mean, that's, and don't always, you know, overanalyze every situation because we tend to do that as financial people, but. Yeah, and, and I think that, like you're all saying, you know, start somewhere and then see where you will, you will develop your own preferences. You will decide, no, I don't want to, I don't want that promotion because I don't want to work harder. Or yes, I do want that promotion. I'm going to work harder. You will figure out what's important to you as you start that journey. Cause I don't think we can all know what's that important to us early on. And I, and I always tell people that I'm mentoring, um, you don't need my career, right? You might hate my career. Um, I liked my career, but maybe that's not you. So it, you should just be, you know your life best and your situation best, but um, being open to what's happening around you, the opportunities and not being so narrow that I need to go this path and missing that these things over here could, could be happening and like, oh, maybe I should go try that. Um, so I, I think that 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 should be just go with what you you want to do and what feels right. So, okay, Pia, should I go back to my questions now, or do you have more? Um, if I can just weave in something that's related to this, so yeah. it yeah, just a quick. So um, they want to know how can they find a mentor like one of you guys <laughs> on the panel, and what role has networking played in your career path? So from a CSULB perspective, I want to say that uh, the SCPD undergrad program offers mentors. So for those that haven't pursued that, you should. I'm actually a mentor and I think my mentee might be on the call right now. Um, and the MBA program also has a mentoring program and I have one of those students on today as well. So from a CSULB perspective, from a work perspective, I'll let these guys answer, um, did they have mentors? How did they get mentors, et cetera? I mean, absolutely. I've had mentors throughout my career. Um, you, it, in public accounting, it's usually a supervisor, a senior or a manager that you work for. Uh, in private industry, it's a CFO or a controller or somebody, um, usually in finance, somebody up, above you up the ranks. Um, and it's ne I've never had, I don't think I've ever had like a formal mentoring program. It's always been more informal. We're I don't even know if we ever use the word mentor, <laughs> but um, somebody just takes you under their wing and offers you advice and takes time to just chat with you. And um, yeah, th those have just been invaluable moments in my career. And I think all of the, all of us probably who have benefited from that um, just tend to naturally pass that on. And because we, we know how important it is and how, um, and selfishly how good it feels to pass on wisdom to somebody else. So it's been more informal in my case, but um, it sort of happens throughout the, throughout the, um, the career path. I'd say don't be afraid to ask for advice and, and you know, seek out people that you're, you're you know, observing and think are doing great. And don't, don't be afraid to ask them to sit down with you and give them your advice and your counsel, because most people that have been successful are more than willing to do that. So, you know, don't be afraid, don't be shy about asking people, you know, for your, for their guidance. Yeah, it was a little hard. Um, probably Roxanne knows this too, but, you know, being uh, 
20 years ago, a woman that was achieving, it was hard to find men that would really give you honest feedback. <laughs> I think they were afraid to uh, sometimes. So yeah, asking for uh, commentary about how you're doing um, and tell them you want honest feedback is really important. I think there's a lot more formality around it today. Uh, mentor, you know, formal mentoring and feedback um, and letting people hear, you know, just in time feedback is, is really good these days. So um, I see the future is bright in terms of mentoring. I, I tell my, my mentees, and if they're on the call, they've heard me say this, that um, your, your network and people that can mentor you are people you probably already know. I mean, there are always those networking events and it's great to go to those, but I think you should also just look around at your own network that exists. And oftentimes we don't think about, uh, hey, what about my parents' friends? Or what about my friend's boyfriend's parents or my neighbors? Or there are people that already know you and probably already like you versus a stranger. And people that you work with or used to work with, where did they go? Is that part of your network? Or can they give you advice? And then even people that you work with that are your peers, if you are doing presentations and you say, hey, when I do my presentation, can you give me some feedback after? And I'll be happy to do that for you. There's just all kinds of ways to try different things. And some may be more successful than others. And whether it's a formal mentoring program, you may or may not click with that person. If it's informal, you probably will because you sought them out or vice versa. Um, but don't, don't worry about formal things, whether it's networking, mentoring, but like Roxanne said, ask, go find someone, ask or, or observe. Even if you, they don't even know you're observing them, someone that you admire, there's things they're doing why you admire them. And so try to see what they're doing and see, be yourself, but see if there are things about them that you can, um, can add to your repertoire as well. My soapbox. So Pia, do you have any more? Uh, there are, but we will wait until. Okay. Okay. Well, I just have yeah. I just have a few more. I think honestly, we've covered a lot of what my uh, my separate questions were already. But I do have a couple more that I want to to make sure. Yeah, and um, we can take more questions at the end. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, let's see. I want to I want to talk a little bit about um, the pandemic. I mean, I don't want to, but I think we should. Um, I know, Roxanne, you already talked about the pivoting and uh, being nimble and all of that. I'm just kind of curious whether you have more to add or others have more to add about what, what particular challenges has that caused or maybe even opportunities that that's raised for your organization or the organizations that you support. How, how over this last year and now even coming kind of transitioning hopefully out of it, what, what do you see? Um, because I think it's, it's similar at school and for the students at work, um, you know, how, how is that all gonna, gonna happen? I personally think I'd add to what I said earlier about the pivoting on time. I think that what I, what's the most encouraging thing about to me that happened in the pandemic was that people accomplished things they didn't think they could do. Mm. For example, um, you know, Target said, we, you know, we're not gonna be able to do that level of online delivery, you know, pick up in store. They're doing today what that they, they thought in their plan they would be doing three or four years from now. Wow. And they, they did it in one year, they accelerated three to four years into one year. That's a really incredible accomplishment for an organization. Um, Abbott, is producing more tests than they ever imagined they could ever produce in this amount of time frame. I mean, they added, you know, added facilities, added capability, added training, added, and they did it at such an accelerated pace. What, what I have found most encouraging about this pandemic is that it forced people to see a bigger world view of what was possible. In other words, we set our own boundaries. I, I believe that fundamentally. As an organization, as a person, whatever it is, those are boundaries that fundamentally are pretty much set by us. If you think about the disruptors in the world in Silicon Valley, and I'm doing a lot of work in Silicon Valley right now, these guys don't, the gals don't have boundaries. They really just see, they, they don't see the kind of traditional boundaries that we all put on ourselves and organizations put on themselves. So what I'm most encouraged about through this pandemic is that organizations saw that they could they could close, they could do a virtual close with a thousand finance professionals around the world working from home. That they could 
accelerate by three or four years their ability to do online delivery, that they could accelerate the amount of, of production of COVID tests in, in basically on a dime. I mean, they never thought it was possible working. It was just incredible accomplishment. And every I can name something from every single company that happened that they never thought was possible. But the, the crisis forced, and I always say, don't waste a good crisis. The crisis forced us to do things we didn't, in our, our mind was the limit. The limit was never there. We were the limit. So I'm, I'm so encouraged by that. And I hope that we take out of this pandemic that we can do way more than we ever think we can do. That let's not be so bound by, you know, boundaries that we, we can't think bigger. So I always tell organizations, we've got to think bigger. Why are we, you know, I'll get these, I'll get a, you know, a plan and I'll say, it's not big enough. You know, it's not big enough. We aren't thinking big enough. Why aren't we thinking bigger? So I think, you know, at the end of the day, that's, I think that's an incredible, for all the suffering and all the pain and all the issues that came out of the pandemic, that to me is the light at the end of the tunnel. So that's my perspective. Yeah, I think about too, uh, the tiny little good things of not having to hop onto the 405 freeway to drive to <laughs> school or drive to wherever we have to drive or uh, that because not only is there stress and wear and tear of driving, but there's the time of spending sitting on the freeway or not having to get dressed up every day or not, have, you know, there's, there's in zoom calls. I mean, even though they're not in person, you are really having a really one-on-one uh, -on -one situation. A lot of times I know with my students that I wouldn't have had in a one hour a week office hour. So I feel like there's some goodness, but having said that, I have to bring up one other thing. So I think another skill that the pandemic raises is how comfortable are people on Zoom? How comfortable are they being vulnerable one-on-one -on -one like this? I mean, I don't know if you've seen that with employees or members, board members or other managers. Well, I mean, we just had a board meeting yesterday and it was a hybrid meeting. So some people on Zoom, some people in the, in the room. And it's not ideal at all because there's side conversations that are happening in the room that the people that are not there aren't a party to. Um, and that's just, it, it creates a funny culture mm. if that happens for too long. And the other thing I worry about is for new hires, um, how can their training be as good yeah. as it would have been in person? Exactly. And I, I can't imagine it's the same. And then the last thing I feel like has suffered, maybe not in companies like Roxanne's working with, but some of the ones that I do that are more mid caps, innovation has suffered. There is no doubt in my mind, we're not innovating the way we were pre-pandemic. And we now we've got to kind of reset, you know, and inspire and encourage people to get back to that innovative thinking. Have you seen, all, all three of you, have you seen some people thrive more than others? Like do some people, this situation fit them better and other people not so much, or does everyone seem about the same? Oh, I think everybody's reacting. Go ahead, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I was going to say it's. Uh, I've seen a variety of responses to it, Barbara. I, was, um, I would say people like me, who's previously spent almost three hours a day commuting, it, we're thriving. We're getting more sleep, um, spending less time traveling. Uh, but we have a few employees who live by themselves and don't have family, and I, I worry about them. We worry about them and their health and mental health. It's yes. a tough, tough thing. So um, it's, it's all over the map. I think most people would, would tell you uh, they miss the, um, the collaborative part of the job, being in the office with your team. And yeah, I agree. I think that's the piece we're missing. And maybe that's what Connie is driving the lack of innovation. I don't know. But um, I will say from an efficiency standpoint, to make, to make Roxanne's point even uh, stronger, we didn't realize we could all work from home. We're, we're a private foundation. We make grants. We take a lot of meetings. We have convenings. And not all, not all of our employees had remote access capabilities. So one year ago today, in fact, everybody was asked to start working from home. And our IT department had to provide remote access to every single employee kind of immediately. And uh, to Roxanne's point, it was remarkable how quickly everybody rose to the occasion and got connected and um, devices were upgraded and work just took place. We 
Um, you know, how are checks going to be printed? Who's going to be signing the checks? Do we have to come into the office? That's not safe. We found a company called bill.com that is now processing all of our checks remotely and um, no, you know, like hard signatures required. Things like that are, it's just amazing how quickly problems like that got solved. And we have some issues still on the HR side with supervision of employees. We have inconsistency there and things that just need to be worked out. Um, we've had some bumps along the way with parents, with the schools being closed. That was a real hardship. And so we've tried to do our best providing tutoring and childcare services, extended leave, flexible scheduling. Um, but that's probably, I mean, just from our internal perspective here, that's probably been our number one challenge is that the parents with kids at home trying to juggle their, you know, school age kids at home while doing a job. Yeah. Uh, that, that's been the number one challenge. So I think we're all looking forward to schools being yeah. open again. But, but I know <laughs> I'll be behind us soon. I know what you're saying. Yeah. I remember, you know, again, I just, I taught, I was teaching two classes last year when it all got shut down. And I just remember thinking, here's uncharted territory. And the university, like a lot of organizations, just did an amazing job. The communication, the decision-making, I, I don't know. And the dean, the dean has left the call. So I'm, I wish he could, he's heard me say this before. I've just been blown away about how leaders were able to step up and do what had to be done um, without having anything to follow before. So it can be very impressive. I, I agree with that. Okay, um, Pia, any other questions? Should I keep going? Um, I do have a question. Should I ask now, or can I? Or should I wait? Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, what are the most important interview questions that interview interviewees struggle with that you would um, like to see them better prepared? And sort of, I think you know, I can tie in another question with with that, which is. Um, um, uh, this young woman, she is, uh, she, uh, by the time she completes her education, she will be in her mid thirties. What would you recommend for her to stand out during the hiring pr process? I think she's going to have an advantage because she will have had some great experiences. I'm sure that she can talk about. And, you know, if you really think through who you're interviewing with, um, and you can correlate what you've learned to date with how it might bring value to that company, you know, she'll definitely stand out. Yeah, there's, uh, I was just gonna add the, um, there's the old trick question in the interview that almost always comes up, which is, you know, tell me about an area you can improve on, or, um, you know, tell me about one of your weaknesses. And it's a trick because you can't say I don't have any weaknesses. <laughs> On the other hand, you can't you know, bash yourself uh, too much. But um, you know, there's a way to delicately handle that question. But the the one the one thing you would you don't want to do is to, to declare no weaknesses. And um, or a similar thing is if you have, or if you're asked to rate yourself on a scale of one to ten, a, a ten in any area is always um, usually is suspicious. I mean, um, it shows a little bit of humility, I guess. Is, uh, I see a mistake made once in a while where I just, I don't see any sense of humility and um, sometimes that's not handled the best way. It, it's tough. I mean, interviews usually, um, somebody told me a long time ago, just and think of an interview as a conversation with a purpose. And so it, it's not such a rigid back and forth thing, but more of a natural thing. And if you can get the if you can get the interview into a conversation that's flowing a bit more naturally, then I, I think that's your your best your best bet. Yeah, I think Dan, to your point about a weakness, I think I would rephrase it to something I could be better at. I can develop more yeah. instead of a fatal flaw. I would yeah. probably yeah. phrase it more as you know, I'm not I'm not sure this is a weakness, but I think I can grow more or learn more or train more or something. I think that's how I would right. answer that one. But you're right. I tend that, to be too hard on myself. That's my answer. Yeah. I tend to be too hard on myself. Yeah, right. That's a good right. answer. <laughs> Any other response to that? Okay. Okay, Pia, any other? I know we're down to 10 minutes. Um, 
I'm sure we could end a, a minute or two early if there aren't any more. I, I want to just double check that I don't have any more because I, I might have one or two more. But again, I think we've covered most everything I wanted to cover. Um, I, I actually have more, uh, more questions here. Go ahead. Yeah. Then I'll let you because I feel like mine have kind of been already covered. Okay, so this is um, it's from actually from one of my students. Um, what's the most common and worst habit and or characteristic that you have seen in the business world that you recommend, um, you know, young people should drop? Like they should not carry it with them and get rid of that habit ASAP. You're saying like every other word. <laughs> <laughs> I find I, I do that now too. <laughs> Say get rid of the word I and focus on we. I think that um, too many people, even at senior levels can say I too much. It's, it's not I, it's never I, it's always we because um, it's always a we. So stop, drop the word I and focus on we. <laughs> we just, we just uh, turned down a board candidate who I thought said I entirely too much. And that just did it for me. I just, I couldn't do it <laughs> and say yes. That's a good one. Yeah, and I think um, if show a sense of collaboration and willingness to help others in in the department, uh, don't just stay focused on your own narrow agenda. You um, yeah, you're not going to impress anybody by you know making anyone else look bad. If somebody needs help, show show your uh, supervisor you're willing to help out. That, that goes a long way with me. And I just wanted, one, I wanted to just reiterate something Roxanne said earlier, not necessarily with younger staff, but in business in general, this ability to take something complex and distill it into something simple is a true way to distinguish yourself. Um, and I don't, wouldn't expect that from an entry level staff person, but over time in your career, that skill is, um, it is just so precious. And so few people have it. Right? So many people just just get bogged down in the details and the complications, and it's tough. But if you can take something complicated and translate it back into some plain English version of it, that tells me you've mastered it. And um, that's that's like nirvana to me. If you want to you want to get to that point. And I think that is a sign of real leadership because a leader is trying to move an organization. We're all we're all going through change in many ways and at lightning speed. And if you can get an organization down to the, to the fundamentals and have them all kind of on the same page because that message is simple and they get it, you can move an organization very quickly. And I agree hundred percent. And, and I think, <clears throat> you get, I, I always tell people, everybody's a leader. You're a leader. You can be a leader with your attitude. You can be, even if you're not in a leadership position, you can lead. You can lead in, in so many different ways. It's just how you approach your job every day and how you interact with people and your attitude and your approach to things. That's, that shows leadership. So start from day one, drop the they too. So I say drop the I, drop the they. They did this, they did, it's not they, we are they. Mm -hmm. Because you're part of, we're a part of a group. We're, we're an organization. Everybody says, well, they didn't let us do this or they did. don't come with that attitude, come with we, need to consider, we need to think about, maybe we could do this better. Don't be afraid to make your ideas known, but stop blaming they because you know, you, we are they. So we're all part of the they. Um, it's not just the people from up on high that are making decisions. Everybody's making decisions and everybody has a role to play. So from day one, that's my view. And I think that some, having somewhat of a positive attitude, I mean, you don't have to be smiley, smiley all the time, but having a positive kind of a can do attitude. And I always think about, you know, my, would, would someone pick me to work with them? Would I be someone they'd want on their team? Uh, would I hire me? What, you know, when you, when you look at yourself, you have to sometimes step back and look at yourself and say, am I good to work with? Do I do my part? Do I, what do I bring to the table? Um, so it's a little bit of self-reflection every once in a while to see how you're doing. You should never be surprised at the end of a semester with the grade. You should never be surprised at an annual review at work. You should kind of always know because you're self-reflecting a little of how you're doing. Um, and we're never gonna be perfect, but 
um, I always like to think about what I what I hire me. Um, it's kind of an interesting question, right? Are you adding value? What do, what do you bring? Would would you pick me to be on your team? And if not, why not? Or if why, why would you? So those those yeah, kind of I'd, Barbara just reminded me of one more nuance to this. I just wanted to add. I tell my staff when I hire them on, if you're bringing me a problem, don't just bring me a problem and dump it on me. You know, if you want to distinguish yourself from somebody else, offer a solution along with that problem, even if it's out of left field. You always want to come forward with some, give your boss yeah. an out, you know, just yeah. something to latch on. Otherwise it does, you know, you don't want to come across feeling like you're dumping yeah. problems. So you want to add value. It's, it's, That's yeah. I agree. Okay, Pia, did you have any more? Because if not, I want to spend a minute. Oh, did you have more? Yeah, I'm sorry. Can I? Yeah, I, I, these are like from two. Sure. two We're getting uh, tired, but one more. How about that? One, one more. Two. So the, this actually questions uh, the two questions from two different people, but they're kind of the opposite ends of spectrum. So I'll ask both. So what is one thing that would instantly disqualify, in, in your perspective, someone in an interview? And the, uh, the other question is, what would one skill or ability that you would immediately be attracted to? Um, for me, zero, zero confidence is, an, is an immediate, usually an immediate disqualifier. Because no matter what the job is, I want somebody who's going to be able to conduct themselves um, with confidence and represent our department. It doesn't mean they have to be, you know, showy and with a big ego but somebody who communicates well makes good eye contact if there's somebody that's really kind of meek and mild head down doesn't have questions not showing curiosity that that, that sort of is in that category of disqualification I, I would have to say and sorry I forgot the second half of that question I, I have to share with you I remember when I worked uh it was Hughes Aircraft Company before it was Hughes Electronics because of Howard Hughes way back when but we never ever made um, aircraft. We made things that went on an aircraft. And I had one person interview and said, I said, why did you want to work here? And they said, oh, because I love, I love airplanes. I want to build. And I'm mm. like, you know, Roxanne, to your point about they didn't do any, that would have been the easiest homework to do. And that to me would be an immediate disqualifier. Not knowing what the, what the organization does you're interviewing for. And, and what is one skill that you would immediately be attracted to? Uh, you know, I think I've seen it happen in interviews where somebody's taken something complicated, maybe from a complex industry or field that they worked in, and they're able to translate that back to me and explain what it is they did in a real succinct way. And uh, to me, that's, a, that, that's something that's kind of unique. And I, and I, I don't think... expect it, but I think that's great. Yeah, sorry, what you're that. saying is it's it's being able to tell a story um, and being able because that does kind of show your value, but it also shows you're a good communicator. And I think on the part of communicating, we haven't talked much about it, but I think it's so critical to be a good listener. And a lot, you know, people, we're in a high anxiety world where things are going so fast and people really sometimes have a hard time truly listening. Such a good point, Connie. I, I think I remember someone saying they went on an interview and the person they, that was interviewing them talked the whole time. And I said, that's okay. If that's what they wanted to do and you sat there and listened, that's, what are you gonna do? Not gonna interrupt them um, if they're interviewing you, right? So knowing who you're interviewing with is, is a good, that's a good recommendation. Okay, so I'm gonna take a minute. First of all, on a selfish note, great to see you guys. But thank you so much. I can't even tell you um, how valuable this has been for me and heartwarming for me that you all stepped up and took time to do this. Um, but I'm sure it was valuable for everyone that listened because you have so much that you offered uh, sincerely and honestly, and um, just, just great. I'm just so proud to um, have been able to moderate this panel. So thank you so much, Pia. Thank you for letting me um, host this. And um, I will let you take it from here. Thank, thank you, Barbara. And I cannot thank you enough for helping us with this. Uh, and thank you, Dan, Roxanne, and Connie. I, I wish I could spend the next four hours with you guys, but you know, I, I know you have 
much better things to do. Uh, but yeah, I, I am so grateful that you took the time on a Friday afternoon, come and spend with our students, give our students very extremely valuable advice. Uh, we hope you can join us in the future. We plan to continue the symposium. So we hope, you know, at some uh, in the fall or, you know, next spring, you can join us again in person. You know, hopefully it's uh, this was meant to be in person uh, when we originally thought about it, but then we had to pivot. You know, you talked about pivoting. We had to pivot. And instead of canceling it completely, we decided to um, take it online. Um, so uh, so thank you again. And thank you to all the participants um, here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please uh, join us next Friday. Uh, that That's day two of our symposium, uh, same time. Uh, 1 15 to 4 30 p.m we are going to have a couple of experts on mergers and acquisitions and then a panel of four our our recent alumni so two to three years out of um, CSULB and they will talk about their experience in looking for a job and you know what their experience has been on the job and how, um, you know, what they wish they could have learned in school, what they did, what they did not, and, and share their experience with you. Okay, so once again, I thank, uh, thank you to everybody. If, you know, if any one of you want to stick on and, you know, ask us a few questions, we are here. Um, but otherwise, have, an, uh, have a great Friday evening and a great weekend. Thanks, Pia, for organizing. Thanks, thank you for having us. Thank you. Nice to see you guys. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Take care. Bye.